Hello, good morning, and welcome to News File. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, as you know, we put Ghana first. And this morning, we'll be asking the question why it has become so difficult for people to put on this. Why is that so? Why would people prefer to pay 12,000 CDs? or between 12,000 to 60,000 go to jail for four to 10 years just for not wearing this. And by doing so, endangering themselves at the risk of COVID-19. There's a new variant. It kills very fast. Ghana's ICUs are full and people are reporting at the hospitals in critical condition. You've heard of the people who have died. We'll let you know some of them, but of course there are many that you and I may not know. How will the state enforce the law on mask wearing? Galam say fight. Has the fight been lost completely? Or it was never really won. How did it happen that as many as 30 soldiers, military officers in uniform, were protecting or still are protecting a concession that is in challenge? the ministry or government officials entrusted to ensure that this does not go on encountered the military and they overcame them we'll tell you that story and how to remove the roadblocks so we can win the fight going forward the president is no more appointing 126 ministers he suffered a lot of criticism for bloatedness of the government. He justified it. Today, he's thinking about 85 ministers, scrapping some ministries. Is this forced, compelled, or voluntary decision out of the criticism? Then we will look at the election petition. Is the apex court sacrificing justice? for speed, on the altar of speed. We'll look at everything arising from the election petition. We'll be right back to deal with the VEX matters. You're welcome back. This is News Files, your most authoritative news analysis platform. Here is your legal light, Ayenini legal light. Stop abusing the uniform, police. This is part two. Journalist Umaru Sanda rightly asserted his rights the other day when he refused to be bullied by police officers who abused the uniform in the name of conducting a search on him. We must all submit to law enforcement for in doing so, we secure our own and collective security and protection. In fact, we are expected to do the good citizen duty by tipping the police off and assisting them to raid our communities of criminal elements. We must, however, not allow any person in uniform to resort to indignifying and unlawful means while on a floric and seeking to abuse our human rights in the name of law enforcement. If we allowed such including unlawful arrests and searches, we will soon regret it. Misguided elements in uniform would plant contrabands on innocent persons so they could turn to arrest, search, and implicate them. Criminal elements in uniform and their collaborators would go on a robbery mission 
enter our homes, offices, shops, and cars in the name of conducting searches without warrants. Terrifying stories have been told of some who allegedly ransacked homes and offices, seized, stole, and even <laughs> shot at hapless people and bolted without a trace, all in the name of security operation. There is good reason the police power to search without a warrant from a, a, without a warrant from a court is not the norm, but the exception. This exception is guided by the law that there must be, quote, reasonable cause, unquote, but not any filmsy, whimsical, or malicious motivation. One definition of reasonable cause is a state of facts warranting a reasonably intelligent and prudent person to believe that a person has violated the law. It must be based on objective and articulable facts. Our law says a police officer can search you without a warrant only where he or she has reasonable cause to believe that something that has been stolen or unlawfully obtained or about which a crime has been or is being or is about to be committed is being conveyed, concealed, etc. And that's in section 93 of our Act 30. There is a reason why by our Constitution, Article 18.2, you lose the privacy of your home, property, correspondence, or communication only under circumstances including for the prevention of disorder or crime. It is standard procedure that the police must approach and deal with you politely as the search could result in arrest and seizure. I was glad to hear the head of education, research and training of the police MTTD, Superintendent Alexander Obing, confirm this and that police or people have a right to record the encounter with police. If they are searching you, you have every right to record it. The constitution says your dignity must be inviolable. Sadly, here in Ghana, police conduct searches, leaving their fingerprints on everything they touch. I wonder if they think about the implications of that. Recently, the Ontario Court of Appeal, that's in Canada, made nonsense of two cases by reversing convictions because police failed to follow the basic procedure of informing a suspect of his rights before questioning even with a search warrant from a court. He made self-incriminating statements. He was arrested and questioned despite asking to first see a lawyer or have access to a lawyer. This other person was stopped over a broken license plate. But smelling marijuana, he was searched and several cell phones, <laughs> cannabis and ammunition found on him. He admitted to carrying a gun. He was strip searched, arrested and questioned. Prosecution admitted they breached his charter rights by their conduct and searching his phone without a warrant. Corporate with lawful searches, but do as is required of the law. And the law is exactly what the Canadian Court of Appeal has told us. The same thing right here in Ghana. Thank you very much. Now, let's get to deal with the vex matters we have to canvas for you this morning on the show. We'll begin with why you have a difficulty wearing this piece of cloth, face masks. Why is that difficult, so difficult to do? Now, for those of you who still think that coronavirus is not real, Take a look at this. We're showing you a number of prominent people, over a dozen of them. And these are those that have been announced as having been killed by COVID-19. There are many more that we do not know and have not encountered. So just take a look at that and convince yourself that it is worth 
getting your sanitizer, making sure that you are frequently sanitizing or washing your hands and uh, running water as much as possible. And that at all times, when you are outside in the public, you have your mask on. Take a look at this. of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. He died on April 10, 2020. We have just been informed about Dr. Amwakutufo, presidential advisor and founding member of the New Patriotic Party, who has fallen to COVID-19, Dr. Richard Kessie, a respected consultant surgeon at the Trust Hospital, Anthony K.K. Sam, who was Chief Executive of Second D, Takaradi Metropolitan Assembly. Daniel Oklemensa, former Managing Director of the Bulk Oil Storage and District and Transport, Bost Company Limited. Of course, we showed you Kojo Wusifriye not long ago, Chief Executive of the Forestry Commission. Kwesi Chum Ado head of health, safety, security, and environment at the Ministry of Energy here in Accra, Nanabeying Prat. He was a public relations expert and lecturer at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, Gimpa. Joshua Treme, national security boss. He died on the dawn of Monday, January 18, 2021, at the Ga East Municipal Hospital where he was receiving treatment. Dr. Henry Owusu Boateng, medical superintendent of the Kwadaso SDA hospital. You heard his story, he's right in your shot. Alaji Mustafa Uti Boateng, CEO of the Chocho Industries. Ben Arthur, who was the executive secretary of the coalition of NGOs in water and sanitation, Koniwas. Frances Ewa Tremating, she was the Associate Director of Students' Life and Engagement at Ashesi University. Leonard Jikunu, Head of Corporate Finance at Fidelity Bank. Dora Ba, a junior school teacher at Ghana International School, that's GIS. Tarek Minkara, who was a spare part dealer and a popular figure in Kumasi. Kwabina Menu, Denmark-based executive member of the New Patriotic Party, died in a Danish hospital on March 19, 2020. And there are those many faces that we don't know. We can only say that peace be on their souls and wish their families well. But just so you know, coronavirus is real. Now let's listen to some patients who are receiving treatment, recovering, we understand, and the pain they are in and the advice they have for you. I used to call myself the COVID police until the, the police caught me. <laughs> what I'm going through, I, I was very serious about it. Everywhere I went, I was campaigning for it. But one day, I just lost guard myself, and then it happened. So just, just be careful. It doesn't matter who or where you are. Grandchildren were for a party. And after the party, they swam. So when they came to me, I think two days later, mm -hmm. 
the big granddaughter was having some symptoms by then I didn't know the symptoms my head was like a running loose after four days I also started feeling a bit throat itchy but I didn't take it serious I just went to do my concussion what I would say it's not a comfortable disease yeah what? people should take the warning seriously people should observe the protocols the disease is here. It is not a fake. Surprisingly, I've been very careful as to how to manage my affairs on this COVID issue. Mm. But sometimes you are constrained. You find yourself in a lot of activities you cannot run away from. And so before I rise, Jack, you have it. All right. Kwame Sapo Esiedu, thank you very much for joining us. He's pharmacist and fellow, Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana. Hello, Kwame. Yes, Kwame, okay, please unmute. Got, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thanks, Samson, for having me. Great. Um, so in the studio, I have Dr. Dominic Ayene, who is MP for Boga East and member of the legal team of John Mahama. We will be joined via uh, Zoom by Clara Berry Kasati, who is lawyer and lecturer at University of Ghana School of Law. Clara is on. Thank you very much for joining us, Clara. <coughs> Hello, Clara, unmute, please. Um, thank you very much for, for having me. And good morning to your listeners and viewers and everyone across Great. the country. Great. Beyond. Uh, here in the studio also is Dr. Bernard Okoboy, former Deputy Minister of Health and member New Patriotic Party Communications Team. Thank you for making the time, sir. Yes. Gary Nimakoma, who is member legal and con constitutional committee of the New Patriotic Party. He will also be joining us uh, later when we begin the discussion on the elect election petition. But Kwame, I start with you. And I saw you make a post where you gave a figure of 5,000 Ghana cities as a standard that anybody could expect to spend in treating themselves, that is if they survived, uh, in treating themselves uh, for COVID-19 for the very short period that some have encountered. How is that? Um, thanks, Samson, and good morning to all panelists. Um, it's a bit worrying because uh, managing COVID-19 in Ghana in public institutions is free. The government has borne the responsibility of paying for the management since the start of this pandemic. Unfortunately, in this second wave, <laughs> most of the facilities have been full and people are having to use a lot of private facilities and these private facilities are paid for i remember your colleague raymond Aka also saying that he had a similar bill when he was hospitalized and nearly lost his fight with this virus right i have then had a number of my friends close friends and family as well who unfortunately have also gotten this and have come up with bills as that. I am aware and I have got um, receipts for a lady from Turkey as well, who unfortunately came to Ghana and caught the virus and hear this, and I'll send you the documents later, um, Samson. The total bill <coughs> over the three weeks that they stayed in hospital in Ghana is close to 43,000 Ghana cities. And I have cross-checked this. Hmm. So I made that post tongue in cheek, making people understand that though the government has borne these costs, the government is also actually incurring similar costs, albeit those going to government facilities are not having to pay for it. However, if you're unfortunate and you get unwell with this virus currently, 
and you are taking into some of the private facilities that have the ability to manage you, even if you pass away. And that is the thing, Samson, even if you pass away, you are going to be saddled with a huge bill in debt. That is not a Russian roulette to pay, mm. especially when under these circumstances, you cannot even be sure of funeral, um, what you call it, donations, because funerals are being constrained. So we are in a time where damn if you do and damn if you don't. And no one can compel these private facilities to charge less. Because if the government was to put out its figures for University of Ghana, for Kolebu, for Konfanoche, based on the tests that they have to do, you will be surprised at their numbers. And I'm quite sure Dr. Koboy would reluctantly put some of those numbers up. Their numbers are also hovering around same, but just that it's being borne by the state, so mm. no one knows. Okay. And the bigger question we have to ask ourselves is for how long can we allow this to happen? Right. Um, what's, what danger do we face? And uh, guys, I appreciate, particularly from the government people, when they say, uh, spread calm, don't spread fear. <laughs> It's not about spreading fears, it's about talking about the facts. What danger do we face as a nation when our ICUs are full? And as you just said, people now have to resort to private, you know, institutions, medical facilities. Um, at a time, at such a time, we are not doing what we were doing earlier where we went out to test and isolate and treat, but wait for people to fall ill and come to the hospital. And as we are being told, people get to the hospital critically ill. And that is beginning to give a meaning to why we are hearing of the deaths at a faster rate. Right. I would have to be blunt. And I have to because we are not in a time where holding back is going to serve any purpose. This week, I've known 12 people, not just acquaintances, human beings with families who I know personally who have succumbed. A friend of mine, Kofi Amekuji, made a post yesterday. We were debating and direct, and he said it's getting to the point where if this was politics, we would say one death, one family. And that is how serious it has become. So this is the thing. When we changed our testing strategy, there was reason for it. Because at that time, our positivity had gone down. And the WHO says that when your positivity is below 5%, then it means you are testing quite well. For a long time, our positivity had been over 10, 15%. So when it dropped, and considering that the PCR testing is expensive, the government in its wisdom, based on the advice it received from the health um, technocrats, decided to change our testing strategy where we only tested symptomatic people who fitted the case definition and came to our hospitals. There was a saving there. But what it also meant, based on the disease we are dealing with, COVID, where in the trajectory, you are aware that about 85% of all cases are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. It meant, therefore, that our testing was only capturing the 15% who were getting symptoms and coming into hospital. And for a long time, we had been doing that. Therefore, the 85% were in the community, and at best, even amongst the 15%. As a pharmacist, I've spoken to colleagues in Ghana who tell me that a lot of them would come to the pharmacy with all these symptoms, and you tell them to go and test, and they were saying that, well, I don't want to, can't be bothered to go to hospital. I know what they are going to give me. Try and give me it. Or you signpost them and say, go to this testing facility, and they say, I don't have 300 to 1,000 CDs to be paying to get tested. So these people were in the community and with a disease that has a reproductive number of three 
unchecked, which means that on average, every infected person would infect three people unchecked. And knowing that, we were not wearing our face masks. We had avoided social distancing. We were um, aggregating and holding parties and rallies and all the things that actually caused the virus to move. The exponential growth was going on in the community. What does that mean? The unfortunate thing about the public health pandemic domino effect is that the more people get infected, the bigger the 15% become in true numbers. That is those who become symptomatic and have to go into hospital. Mm. <laughs> the bigger the 15% becomes, the more people get hospitalized. Mm. The more, more people get hospitalized, mm. the more our facilities get filled up. The more our facilities get filled up, the more people are going to get critically and severely ill. And unfortunately, the more are going to go into ICU. And unfortunately, the Grim Reaper, the more are going to die. This is the reality we are saddled with now. So what we are seeing is the lag of the domino effect from the time the infections happened to the time where, unfortunately, people are succumbing. Then you've got the actual um, extra existential threat, which is a lot of the facilities that government built were well schooled to deal with the pandemic. So you'd realize that at the beginning, our case mortality ratios were relatively low. As they get filled up, people are using peripheral health facilities who, though the health professionals may be willed and skilled, the accoutrements to actually manage the disease as it gets complicated are not available. And therefore, quality of care also drops. That also leads to mortalities. So we are dealing with a barrage that is contributing to people getting very sick and our mortalities increasing. And the downside being that a lot of people are also living with what's called long COVID or post COVID because they are getting symptoms that even though they are getting discharged are lasting longer than they normally would if they are going into hospital early. All so right. these are the realities <clears throat> of the time. All right. Uh, thank you, Kwame. Uh, Dr. Kuboi, I, I remember that at the start, um, when we started preaching, because everywhere else in the world, they were thinking and planning how to assemble, um, what do you call them? Ventilators. Ventilators. At the time, as a country, we could not even boast of a hundred of those. Mm -hmm. At this time, when the ICUs are full, how, what, how are we doing, really? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Samson. Uh, good morning to all your viewers. Uh, let me also use this opportunity. I'm in black because uh, today we'll be attending the funeral of... Um, Elder James Kojo say, that's the brother of the chief of staff. Um, and so my condolences to her. Mm -hmm. And um, the brother's daughter, uh, that's the niece, is a f doctor, a physician I work with at the Lekma Hospital. He's the med soup. Mm -hmm. So my condolences to her as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me say that it's true. I mean, I followed what my brother um, from CDD said, and most are on point. Um, the last time when the president spoke, he actually mentioned that, yeah, we are not in good times. Our cases had gone beyond the 2000 threshold. And I tell people that there is bad news and there is good news in there. The good news is that the mode of transmission of the virus hasn't changed. What it means that what we've been taught from day one, if we continue to go by that, you reduce your risk of getting it. Although we've had variants, it basically moves the same way through um, droplets through the air in enclosed spaces and all that. I want to be frank with some of these things. You see, the science tells us that if you have large numbers, the risk is high. Yes, we had rallies and all that political activity, but normally the incubation period between the time of getting the virus and falling ill, we're looking at two to let's say four weeks. So yes, gathering, there is a possibility or risk with it. But we realized that we weren't getting as many cases a month or two when the campaign peaked, like we had in the festivities. So some of the GHS technical people, we, we, we did some small history and research into the background of the cases. What we realized is that most of the people that came down with the illness were people who had 
middle, upper class had gone for parties, programs. The numbers were not that huge, but they were in enclosed environments. And so we realized that there's a serious risk also that comes with having programs in an enclosed setting. And the reason is simple. It's not just the enclosed setting, but the length of the contact. Once you are in an enclosed setting, it comes to eating, your mask must go off. So basically, if you are only five in a room, but it's enclosed, within an hour, the particles in the air is coming from all of you. And if one person has it, all can come down with the illness. So really, we've also done some work, I mean, locally, to understand why the peak happened. And as a scientist, I'm careful the way I speak. Uh, I've heard people who talk about political activity. The risk is not zero. Yes, you can speak to some risk, but in terms of the history of the cases that we've had, the numbers in our hospitals now, a lot of them found themselves in these, uh, how do you call it, these uh, enclosed um, gatherings where even if you are few, you are sharing the same air. I think I also made a point to a friend that once the global risk of COVID goes up, as in the second wave in Europe and America, we are not totally isolated in terms of risk because the world is a global village. We have a testing regime at the airport. It can pick, if there are 1,000 positives, it can pick 999. There is no guarantee. In fact, even with a strict test, testing regime, globally, the standard is that one or two can uh, move out. You know, before coming here, I read, I don't know what I've seen, the Danish release. There is a, a release from, I think, Netherlands, rather, about people from Ghana now having to do um, an antigen test, even if you have a PCR test. And the reason is that you can have a PCR test, but you can uh, maybe with it just before coming, it's possible that you can have the virus. But I refer to the Netherlands release for one reason. Their protocol doesn't allow kids one to three years to be tested. I think one to four. And the reason is that because it's a traumatic experience, most places they exempt kids. But here we are, the science also has taught us that a child can have it and still be okay. But when you enter your population, you can give it to elderly folks. And like the woman who you interviewed spoke about the children. So the point I'm making is that globally, we're in a pandemic. A risk elsewhere can be a risk here. So let me speak to what government is trying to do to address the situation. It's true, um, you can't really blame government that much for um, reducing the intensity of the contact tracing because our cases went down significantly, like my colleague hinted. It got to a point you had about 300 active cases. Now, if you have 300 people and you are going after their contact, their number will not be the same as when you had, let's say, 900 cases. And our isolation centers, uh, the one at Kasua became virtually empty. Most of our treatment uh, facilities too were not having cases. So they dissolved the gangs, the medical groups we had. You know, we had to form some COVID teams. We pull doctors from Kolebu, uh, inter uh, intensivates nurses from other places. When it got to the time when they weren't having much cases, they dissolved the, them. What we've done now is to regroup, to bring them back. Um, University of Ghana Medical Center, Kolebu and Gaist were the classical treatment centers. As I speak, we have created another treatment center at the Ridge Hospital, has about 16 beds. The Ghana Infectious Disease Center, which was built with private co collaboration, had some infrastructural challenges, but as we speak, it's been operational for the past, I think, one or two weeks. Has 100 beds, five ICU um, facilities, and HDU, all the beds are HDU, meaning if you need oxygen, all the 100 beds can give you critical care for severe cases. So uh, something like you asked, our ventilator count has gone up significantly. I'm sure it's more than 20, 30 times what we had in the beginning of the pandemic. So we've increased our um, technical capacity. But I want to be very cautious and make a, what's a, give a warning here. I don't speak to this beefed up bed space to encourage you to more or less uh, act funny and be reckless. The good news I continue to say is that in terms of transmission, the virus hasn't changed its way. And I'm happy people are watching this far. Some say this is the most fertile environment for classical transmission of the virus. There are not three talked about the transmission rate. It is when you have a place like this, uh, luckily because of some code, I asked that the air condition go. But when you have the air condition on, this place is enclosed. If we are take off our mask, within one hour, two hours, if you use the electron microscope, you see the place filled up with our particles and we'll be breathing our air. 
So we, although it's not a crowd, and you can even have a six whatever feet distance, still people can get infected. Mm. So really, um, I try to tell people, avoid enclosed spaces. Keep your mask on. If you are, we are 100 here, mm. we are close to each other. We stay here for 10 hours, something, but my mask is on. It will be difficult to give me the virus. So the point I make is that if you can't avoid a particular setting, just make sure that your mask doesn't go off. The temptation comes to feeding. The only time when people, uh, what's the word, is it uh, losing their, uh, Lose their, guard. their guard, is when you have to drink or eat, because you can't drink through the mask. So I tell folks that if you go to a place and it's enclosed, do take away. Don't drop the mask. Uh, five minutes of dropping the mask, you inhale the particles of another person, and that's it. And the virus doesn't pass through your mouth to infect you. The root is the nostril. So once it's about inhaling someone's particles, it is very uh, it's facilitated. Mm. So um, that is what I have to say about, For, and then- be, be, Because of what you just yeah. you know, spoke about, about yeah. being in enclosed places, um, is there, is there danger in having, you know, children being in school from as early as 7, 8 until about 4 p.m.? You know, I, someone asked me, Doc, how come the situation is very, very bad in Europe and America? We are in difficult times, though, but when you compare it to the global picture, even to the African picture, we are not, uh, ours is not as, uh, what's the word, as um, hopeless as it's in the States and elsewhere. And I gave two reasons. You know, the experts in the US, like Fauci said, they were going to experience a second wave in the winter. The reason was for two, it was for two reasons. One, the virus theoretically, I say theoretically, because we are still doing a lot of studies, appears to have preference for cold. And that's why the day that we had 500 people being infected in Tema, I mentioned someone that this must be an environment that looks like North uh, America or the North Pole. And I wasn't, I wasn't surprised when they said it was a fish processing factory because the, it's an enclosed environment with temperatures below zero. Mm. So then it can move very fast. So mm. temperature is one. Mm. Something. The second one is the structure of the community. This is the only time when if you have a community that is not well, would I say developed or structured, you appear to be at lower risk. In Ghana, the kids that go to school, 98%, their classrooms are not air conditioned and closed. It's air comes in and goes out. That's right. Immediately you are in an environment where it is open ventilation. The risk drops significantly. But the particles can accumulate. It is diffused. But in Europe, something, school for kids, even in winter or summer, most of the time is enclosed. You enter the train, is enclosed. Gym is enclosed. Markets, for markets are enclosed. But when you come to Africa, mm. our setting is open. So for kids, I think one re key reason why the president um, allowed the kids to go back to school, one is that most of our classrooms are the open uh, type. The second one, something is that we have an idea as to what caused the spike, this, uh, this recent one. The first one has to do with the social activities that we engaged in. And the second one has to do with a mixing of people who came into our population, as in travel. Mm. Now, if that risk had still persisted, if we were going to enter another festive season, there is no way I would have advised that we open the schools. But that risk factor is going to go down going forward. Uh -huh. okay. and then, uh, yes. And then secondly, kids uh, are known to be quite robust, mm. but they can transmit. And, okay. uh, Something, let me add that we know that there is a risk of the virus in the global population, including Ghana. Yeah, right. And that is why mm. we put in place uh, protocols. Right. Nobody in, can ensure zero risk right. in a pandemic. Mm. What you do is call uh, risk I'll, reduction. I will bring in my lawyers yes, yes, yes. shortly to look yeah. at the enforcement regime, but I need you in one minute, tell yeah. us how ready are we? What is the planning, execution of the plan like for vaccination? All right, so what we are doing now is that there are two routes. There's a global platform that has been created by WHO called the COVAX facility. COVAX means that uh, it's coronavirus access platform. And um, they are allowing middle, low to middle income countries who might not be rich as the West to access this platform. You can get 20% of your population needs. So 20% of our population would be given to us, more or less through a special arrangement, like a grant. But the rest of the 80% 
you have to source pay yourself. Now, so we have applied to that platform. They would start dispersing uh, first quarter to countries that have applied. But we are also exploring the uh, bilateral route. So government, top government officials, I know my boss, uh, my former boss, <laughs> the minister designate, uh, minister for health, is talking to um, some of the manufacturing companies. Ghana is looking at buying some directly also. And then uh, as we speak, there's a technical committee to look at the criteria for the rollout. Who gets first? What is absolute is that health workers are very high on the list. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, people have mentioned the security services because of their uh, mixing with populations outside the country on operations. I also know that elderly people with, uh, who can prove underlying conditions like heart disease, kidney and all that, and, and people with a high turnover rate for meeting others like uh, um, transport operators, people who meet a lot of people in a day, teachers who have to go and mingle with kids and all that. So we are looking at it um, very seriously. Okay. Kwame, um, what would you say about our preparedness in executing a plan for vaccination uh, to conclude? And um, what would you want to see change so that we don't get to the point where we know we don't have money, we just can't? I mean, if we were hit like um, other countries uh, out of um, in Europe are being hit, we can, we can almost be assured that will be damned and doomed. Thanks, Samson. Um, I think um, Bernard has um, addressed the vaccine issue quite well, but we need to understand the game of the vaccine issue. And what do I mean by the game of the vaccine issue? The game of the vaccine issue is the fact that there's what we call the head immunity threshold. That is the number of people in a population you have to vaccinate for you to virtually constrain the disease and prevent it from spreading significantly and for people to get ill. That threshold is calculated by dividing the reproductive number by one plus the reproductive number. So for COVID, the head immunity threshold is 75% because it's three over four which means for Ghana, a population of 31.3 million, you've got to um, immunize 22.75 million people to hit the herd immunity threshold. That's the first thing. COVAX is giving us um, what do you call it? up to 20%. Bernard said 20%, but if you read the, um, what do you call it, the memorandum, it says up to 20%. I am also aware that Serum Institute are having challenges with the Indian government because the Indian government is saying that unless half their population has been supplied, they are going to constrain supplies from serum institute to COVAX, and therefore the distribution is having some challenges. But hopefully, I'm quite sure that that will be addressed with the government of India. But that said, the 20% is 6 million Ghanaians. And we have to in, yeah, I mean, inoculate 22.75. So we've got 16.75 million vaccines that we have to source from elsewhere. That is a huge challenge for government. I'm glad that they have put committees in place to do this. But the speed at which the bilateral routes are moving from countries, I mean, just before I came on this program, I put up a post where Morocco has signed a, um, a bilateral with um, Sinopharm China to, um, what do you call it, get stocks of um, Corovax, which is the Chinese vaccination, um, the vaccine. <laughs> Ghana can go down that route. There's also the Sputnik, but people are edgy about the Russian vaccine. But the data I've seen on that vaccine so far is no different from any of the data sets we have seen for all the other vaccines. So we can look at that as well. But the biggest thing is for us to learn as a country that we cannot continue pussyfooting when it comes to vaccine research and learn to collaborate during the development stages and not wait to get in and seek bilateral agreements when the food is cooked and the vaccines are licensed. That puts you at significant disadvantage. All the countries that have done the bilateral so far participated in the vaccine development of the vaccines for which they have bilateral agreements. That put their foot through the door. Ghana hasn't done that, and we have to learn. Finally, what do I 
I want to see change. I want us to take our personal health responsibilities seriously to start with. The wearing of the mask is no longer a fashion statement or luxury. It is a life and death necessity. And we all need to do that. Then the government has to also realize that no country has citizens who by default are law abiding. Humans by nature are lawless and reckless. In societies where lawfulness persists, it's because modalities are put in place for lawfulness to persist and people are willing to enforce the modalities that ensure lawfulness. We need to do that as well. And I have seen footage of the police arresting people yesterday who are not wearing face masks. I commend them highly, but I'd also want to caution them that arresting them and binding them together into vans and all that is another super spreader event. I know we are resource constrained, but we would have to think seriously about how we head these people together when they are arrested in holding areas before either they are processed for court, they are put in cells or other things, because that could come and bite us as well. Mm. But the police would only arrest you if you don't wear a mask. Right. So if we as citizens are sensible as well, we should save the police the trouble of getting these super spreader events started because they have to arrest us en masse in shopping centers and um, in trotro stations by just wearing our mask. We need to bear in mind that the variants that have come in currently are 50 to 70 percent more contagious than the one that came from Wuhan. That brings a huge challenge to everybody. So like you heard the lady say, you cannot be the virus police. You cannot take chances because this time the virus has gotten smarter. It's dyslexia has made it not copy its gene sequence properly and it has made it more contagious. But the more dangerous thing is it's doing exactly what all human beings do. Mm. It is doing this to survive. All right. So it is outfoxing all the older viruses and very soon we would have only the new variants. And that would be a game changer. So we need to be disciplined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kwame Sapong Esiedu is a pharmacist and fellow Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD. He's been very, very uh, instrumental and availed himself to this country uh, from the UK where he lives since coronavirus broke. Thank you so very much. Now, let me bring in uh, Clara and, and Dominic. Now, Clara, Dr. Dominic Ayene are the ones who sat in parliament and passed the restriction no, Enoko, of... Enoko Boy. Enoko Boy, correct, yeah. <laughs> and passed the Imposition of Restrictions uh, Act. Now, in that law, the president has been empowered and he issued the EIs requiring and mandating everybody to wear a mask once you are in a public place, once you get out of your home. You wear a mask, a face shield, or a face covering. And you are supposed to cover your nose and your mouth completely. So not wearing the mask correctly is also an offense. And if you are found not to be doing it or doing it rightly, the minimum fine is 12,000 Ghana cities. The minimum sentence is four years. You could get up to 60,000 Ghana cities, and you could also get up to uh, 10 years in jail. There has been a crusade. The Ghana Bar Association joined and asked that there should be a relook. As we said, that hasn't happened. There is a suggestion that the police clearly couldn't enforce the law, and that's why they just left everything until the president issued the orders asking them to arrest. They step out of their premises few meters, and we are told that uh, one police station has arrested <laughs> some 90 plus people. What do you think? What can be done? Um, 
I think we we all know, if we are being honest, that if the police is going to enforce that law, they will have no place to hold up the the people that uh, would would have been convicted. Um, so yes, there's an issue. Uh, but it's not realistic uh, in terms of enforcement because l let's face it, even within Accra, if they just even just step out of their house and take a few meters, go to the markets, I don't think there will be any spaces left in the prisons to to take more more people so there's an issue with the law but it also comes i to some extent i i want to understand when it started probably they themselves were panicking and then they they were looking at what they thought could deter um, a lot of people but then they also left out that it was not realistic even from the very beginning and if we know the way our society is it wasn't realistic. And I, uh, in terms of passing laws, I always have a problem when you pass a law that you know is not realistic to, to enforce. Because what when that happens, my concern usually is what then, that, that, uh, that then means, which means that there's going to, it will probably end up being used as a, a victimization or um, 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 persecution too. If you know that, okay, this law is not realistic to enforce, Virtually nobody is obeying it, but then you lie in wait for your enemy that you have been timing for some time so that as soon as they go foul, you can then use such a law. So I have a problem with laws that are that are that are this unreasonable, if you ask me. Ten years in jail, a lot of the Ghanaian population is not going to be able to 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 pay a fine for the, the, the designated fine, for example. And when it comes to wearing of mask, wearing of mask is very, very important. Part of the, the discussion we should also have is to be realistic and know the kinds of populations that we have. If we look at our economy and if we look at incomes of households, let's be honest, how many um, households can afford a mask a day? So do they know the kinds of masks? There has been a lot of education. We need to start asking questions as to how effective the education has been. It's not enough to have the education. If you give information, but you are not able to give it in such a way that the people understand and, and, and comply, your education has not been effective. So we probably need to look at how effective education has been mm. and also probably discuss now we would need the health uh, uh, just, professionals just, sorry, in terms of the so mask. Just, just hold on a second. For those of you watching the television, uh, those people you are seeing are the first set of uh, people that were, you know, arrested. Immediately, the Accra Regional Police stepped out of their uh, office. Uh, so you can see them, and I'm watching them even, you know, use their hands over their faces, bare hands. Uh, what may they have touched and see, see how they are crammed together over there. Uh, they said we're going to process them. I do not know the update yet, how they have managed to process them and which courts they have taken them to. Yes. Okay, Clara, go on. Yes. And even from the video, we can see there's no social distancing either. Zero. Which is another, yes. Which, like Kwame said, ends up being a super spreader itself. Um, just by bringing them together in an attempt to enforce the law. So I think we need to be a lot more creative. And then we also really need to discuss about the issue of mask. Are there some masks that we could probably guide people as to which mask are, they can reuse and how to keep and maintain masks? Because the truth is, we, if we are being honest, not everybody is going to be able to afford a mask a day. The surgical mask, for example, that I understand can only be used once. How many families that every day for how many days a month and in two months that every day they can afford um, um, a mask when they are leaving their home? So probably so, so, so we Cla need to... Yeah, so Clara, I was, I've been telling the story of this uh, person that I interviewed on the street. Uh, around the uh, Abosokai area. And when I asked him why he wasn't in a mask and that he was exposing himself and everything, he told me the whole day uh, what he has made was about five Ghana cities. And the mask, he said at the time, cost that much. So did I expect him to use that money to buy a mask? So my response to him was that the law says face mask, face shield, or face covering. A face covering simply means he is catered for. If he can't buy one, he could find a piece of cloth, 
handkerchief, managed for as long as he can get it to cover his nose and mouth completely, he's safe. So the law took care of other people, right? But how, how has that education gone? For a lot of the people, the, all they know is that I have to wear a mask. So is, have we done sufficient education for people to realize that if I don't have a mask, I can use any other piece of cloth? And have we taught them how to care for the piece of cloth? Because a lot of people really, all they really know is a mask and they think they can't afford one. So it comes back to the effectiveness of our education. I, yes, I, I, we, we always say that uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. But the reality of the matter, too, is that in a situation like a pandemic or like something like COVID-19, nobody benefits when we go singing ignorance of the law is no excuse. It is <laughs> in our interest to educate people what options they have. Mm. Because like the guy you interviewed, it's realistic. He cannot use his five CDs. Um, to buy a mask when that's all he's earned in a day. He needs to eat fast to, 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 to survive. So I think we, we need to revisit and where probably we can support certain sectors of our population, we at least provide them with uh, quite a number of masks, reusable masks, mm. for example, that we, we, we could use and do that alongside enforcement. All right. So this is when we do education enforcement at the same time. And certainly let's take another look at the sanctions of the law so that we can make it more reasonable. Right. And we can know so that enforcement doesn't end up being creating a bigger problem. Mm. All right. Now, uh, it was yes. To solve. Okay. So you, you made the law, Dr. Ayana, you made the law. Um, <laughs> did you think about this, that this was what we we're going to encounter? And since an important body like the Ghana Bar Association stepped in to say, let's have a real look. How have we taken this as an urgent matter? so that we don't get to the point where I have, for example, illustrated that the police would then need buses to go out because within minutes, they will have to arrest many people. Then they will need, you know, stadia of police stations to transport them to, to process them. It will re replicate itself for a court. Which court are they going to take them? Which prisons are they going to put them? How urgent is a review? And look at that against the example that I have also been referring to at in the Volta region. What they did in the whole municipality was that they used their assembly to pass a bylaw. The bylaw was so humane. It said, if you are found not wearing a mask, you will be stopped. There's a spot fine some 100 CDs, 20 CDs, mm -hmm. and then you'll be handed masks. That's, that's very interesting. I, I wonder how that fits into the Imposition of Restrictions Act, as well as the executive uh, instruments that they... It's a, it's mm. a local variant. Right, it's a local variant, yeah. yeah. But, but as you rightly pointed out, it's a very humane way of dealing with the, the matter, and a more, more practical way, because if you pay 20 CDs, and then you are handed a mask, at least you can use that to protect yourself as you roam around, I mean, uh, in public. But something, let me say this, you see, when the president brought the imposition of a restrictions bill to parliament, I think there were two underlying assumptions, all right, that in this public, you know, um, pandemic, you know, health crisis, there cannot be order without law, okay? And I think that's the point that was underscored by you know, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Asidu, Kwame Sapong, when he talked about, you know, briefly on the enforcement. So the assumption was that there cannot be order without law. Mm. So let's have a legal framework that will regulate how we deal with this pandemic because it's a public health crisis, all right? I think the second, you know, underlying assumption is that law, as a, a, a German legal philosopher once put it, is communicative action. So let's communicate to the population that we are taking this matter so seriously that if you violate the law, okay, you are going to pay dearly for it. Because as Clara, you know, pointed out, uh, you know, um, very eloquently, um, <clears throat> if you have a regime that says a minimum payment of uh, uh, a thousand penalty units, okay, and one penalty unit 
is uh, um, 12 cities. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at 12,000 Ghana cities. How many people in this population can pay 12,000 Ghana cities? And then a, a maximum of 60,000 mm -hmm. you know, Ghana cities. So it means that ultimately for a greater majority of our population, you are looking at prison sentences, okay? And you yourself has point, I mean, I pointed out that we will then need, um, you know, stadia, you know, literally, of prisons to be able to contain everyone. You know, when Clara was talking, I was just reliving the experience that I had when I went to home campaigning. Mm. And even recently, <clears throat> I, was, I was home last week, and I attended funerals. And people insisted on shaking hands with me, uh, having their bodily contact and so on. And they were not wearing masks, okay? When I insist that, you know, you need to wear a mask, they would ask me, have you supplied us some? Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, a mask now costs in Accra, two Ghana cities. I can imagine in Zorungu, the number of people who can spend two Ghana cities a day in order to be able to, I mean, afford a mm. mask. And you cannot, I mean, for, for, uh, from a public health, I mean, a perspective, uh, Dr. Okobo is here. This mask cannot be used for more than one day. Yes. So it means that, you know, for a week, if the person has to go out, they need not less than 14 CDs to be able to, I mean, a room. Of course, out. now you can get it for one CD, but we had a report somewhere <coughs> from Tamale where somebody was selling for six CDs. I mean, just, you yeah. don't know how somebody <coughs> even thinks that they can profit here from this. Exactly. So, so something, I, you ask a very poignant question, which is, is, there, is it time for a review? I think it is time for a review. Okay, because, you know, the, uh, the life of the law is not just logic, it's also experience. That's right. So we have experienced the implementation of the Imposition of Restrictions Act um, and the, the pursuant uh, executive instruments that the president <coughs> has passed, all right, up to this point. What you showed, the clips that you showed, mm -hmm. and your own interview on the street shows that this regime <laughs> will not work for us. So we need a more humane regime, maybe the whole municipality example that you gave mm. is something that we need to take up very, very seriously. So we we'll probably need to look at the, I mean, at the sanctions regime very critically. I've had and very senior physicians speak to me from outside of this country. Once they get to know these are the issues you are discussing, right. and I get this very often. Yeah. But once they know you are talking about coronavirus, I get unsolicited, very good views from all right. over. And I hear consistently they empathizing with the poor in Ghana yeah. and say, why can't the state commit to providing free masks? Is that sustainable? Well, I will leave that question to um, my, my good friend, Dr. Okoboy, who has worked at the Ministry of Health. <laughs> but I think, I think it can be sustained, yeah. right, if we commit resources <clears throat> through the assembly, you know, for provision of masks, you know, probably on a monthly basis. Okay, if we make quarterly allocations towards the procurement of masks for households. Reusable ones. Reusable like we ones. did for the students. Right. I think that, I think, you know, is, is doable. We, we are not too poor a country as not to be able to, I mean, afford to do this. I think we can do it. Mm. Yeah. How, how urgent do you find the need to review this? I, I, think, we should, I think we should be looking at it immediately. Mm. I think we should be looking at it immediately. And given what I have seen, you know, I, I will probably begin discussions with uh, my friends on the opposite side about whether or not if the president is not bringing a, a review, you know, a, I mean, uh, of, the, of the law, mm. we can start something by way of yes. a private member's bill. In fact, surprisingly, whilst you fixed the minimum at 12,000, I think the first case, which involved two or is it three pastors, when they were taken to court, and they pleaded guilty, they were handed not the minimum, a little above the minimum. Wow. And they <clears> couldn't pay. So I think we understand it was a Pentecost church or one other yeah. that went to their rescue mm -hmm. and paid for them. I think, I think mm. we Maybe it's good to remind our viewers. Mm. It was not necessarily their, not their non wearing of the mask, mm. it was they breaking the restriction to uh, have yes. their service at a time at when, the time when services there was a had lockdown. Been, yes, yeah. so uh, maybe the judge went for that to send a strong signal that, that at a state we mean business. But the point is that, yeah, I agree that you want as much as possible people to 
be able to uh, afford the sanctions when they have to apply them. But I think the most uh, motivating factor was the deterrence. You know, I think if you look at this particular regime, mm. it was hoped that it would, looking yeah. at the nature of the yeah. sanctions, it would deter people. Right. But uh, from the experience, it appears that it didn't achieve that. All right. So if anybody calls for review, mm. uh, it's something that is in good taste. Okay. Let me quickly say that for public health purposes, you don't necessarily have to be wearing a surgical mask to receive, to reduce your risk. A cloth mask, when washed, if you have three of them, mm -hmm. and you even wash them, at the end of the day, you wash iron. I mean, you can use for some time. Maybe you can, once you wash daily and iron rewash, you can use for about a week or two. So you want to also people to show people how to try to comply within their mega resources. Mm. I'm happy that my colleague from CDD reminded viewers that it, it cost someone 43,000 yeah. to, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to, to go yeah. through COVID. No, yeah. I can't well, them, for instance, yeah. a, a friend of mine yeah. died two weeks ago. Yeah. You know, the bill was 23,000. Yes. Meanwhile, something from day one, I've been telling people, you know, sometimes people create the impression that, oh, I mean, the money that we allocate to COVID and what are we using for? It has been government policy since day one. Once you are diagnosed of COVID mm. and you're in a government facility, from the OPD to the ICU, mm. all is borne by the state. Even so, you sometimes, know, you know, I I don't want us to focus on talking right, about right. yeah, about yeah. failures. Okay, all right. But do you think you really did a good job? Uh, if, as we speak, yeah, there are people who say coronavirus does not exist, mm -hmm. and our, our reporters went to the markets, yeah, and there are people who say there's no need to wear it, yeah. and in fact, some of them were pointing to yeah. the political campaigning period. Do you think you have done the needed education for, for this? To Samson, happen? I'm happy that, again, my brother from CDD reminded you that human beings by nature are what? Uh, lawless. Lawless. Yeah, reckless. Look, there is a difference between, in public health, they teach you what they refer to as the health belief model, which is meant to help someone who has received education to move from the state of behavior to one that will seek better health. It's a very difficult task. There are all kinds of models you are taught to achieve it. What it means is that it's not enough to educate someone and say there is a virus called COVID. When it infects you, you can go down and all that. Until the fellow has a personal experience, they might refuse to do the things you've asked them to do. And when you watch elsewhere, in fact, in Germany, there was a time people went out there to confront the police. Yes. That they couldn't, they couldn't bear it any longer. They've been indoors for too long. When still the risk was out there, so the point I'm making is that government did education, but this transmogrification from behaving in a particular way to another way is another type of If you did the education yeah. and the compliance level, it's yeah. not satisfactory. No. To the extent that police will move out within minutes and they can get a bus load of people. S something. What, what's Think? the evidence of <laughs> Sorry. how effective your education You know, education there, there are two things that helps to drive compliance. Two things. Unfortunately, when the prevalence is high and widespread, it comes more home. People feel it. If, let's say, in every community, you've had three or four who have been seriously ill with You it. don't have this opportunity in, in this situation because no, no, no. it kills. No, no, I'm, I'm, I just want it's, it's education, public education. I'm just telling you that globally, uh, okay. mm. when a disease has prevalence, mm. that goes across. All right. Based on the relevance and um, nearness, people mm. comply. Right. But if you are mm. dealing with a disease, if you watch the, you plot the path of cases in Ghana, Ashanti, Greater Accra, Westin, it's places that receive travelers from Accra, where a lot of people are going. Mm. Unfortunately, because of this is a, an imported disease, many places where you don't have a lot of travelers going to have zero or no cases, like your place that you went to. Mm -hmm. So if you tell them, I look, wear the mask, because they've not had anyone in their hospitals, it looks like it's a theory to them. Mm -hmm. And that's not to support what is happening. All right. But it should tell you the huge challenge you have on your hand mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a disease that appears to be far. The way to address it is what the police is doing. Mm -hmm. You know, for some time, People thought that, look, these laws are just there to, right. you know, for fun. Well, but well, once you hear that, your colleague has been... Well, well you, speak to the, you speak to the police <laughs> and they will tell you how frustrated they are yes. and, and how almost yeah. how impractical no, but, they but feel. But you also saw, they they find if I may come in, you mm. also saw the clip. Yeah. People were in front of the police. 
with their mask not properly on. <laughs> some even but, yeah. mask right. Right. You know, you um, know, okay so so sorry. just, uh, just we, we we need to take a break here right. uh, but i need to get you just in some seconds is there a nasal drop approved for use anywhere in this country uh, for, about covid well i've 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 seen um, I've, people have called me about that one somebody is asking that question yes, mm. yes. Yeah. You know, one thing if a drug is approved in our uh, list of drugs in the country. Maybe it's used for certain purposes. But if someone suggests that it can also deactivate or reduce the entry of virus and use it, at that level, you are using it for the purpose. Mm. But nationally, as a country, we've not come to approve it as a way of preventing the virus. But I know some people are. OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Angela says to tell all of you that the law must be reviewed yeah. yesterday, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> the police themselves will be infected at this rate. And then who will do the arrests? Uh, I have several of such comments coming in. We'll take a break here. When we return, we try to understand how on earth, on Ghanaian soil, where military have been redrawn from the Galamse operations, you have <coughs> as many as 30 armed soldiers protecting a private entity said not to have a license to mine, pillaging the Manso Forest Reserve. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Newsfile. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, as we know, we put Ghana first. I will go straight to Kumasi to speak to Erasto Sasaridonko and then return to the studio. Uh, first to Zoom to speak to Clara and to the studio to uh, Dr. Ayene and uh, Dr. Okoboy. Erasto Sasaridonko, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Erasmus, unmute. Thank you very much for having me, sir. Great. So tell us how you came to go to the Manso Forest to capture this situation uh, where we saw what you guys uh, rev uh, uncovered you went into this particular area and saw the people that were arrested, the Chinese nationals dominantly, predominantly, and then you saw military uniforms in the, in the place. And then before we could say Jack, one officer came, had an interaction, was very angry, made a phone call, and a dozen other military officers came, and we are told they overpowered even the government's specialized team that was going around to do this work. How did you get to go there? Hello, Erasmus. OK, so uh, we're having a bit of a difficulty with Erasmus's line. We would rather bring him on, on the phone so that we may be able to uh, go on. So this was a, a story that was published um, earlier on the 18th that said that despite the withdrawal of all military personnel from mining sites across the country, Love News has evidence of over 30 fully armed military men protecting miners degrading the forest of Manso in the Ashanti region during the team's journey to this part of Manso and its forest uh, scenes, scenes of destruction and de degradation were visible from miles away. Abandoned pits and mining settlements dotted the road leading into what is left of the once lush forest. All right, Erastos, so tell us how you got to go there. Hello, Erastos.
Erasmus? Yeah. Okay. Let's hear you. All right. So I was approached uh, by the environment uh, minister uh, to follow this task force, uh, which is uh, uh, a Ministry of Environment, Science and Innovation, EPE, stroke EPE uh, task force, I was told. And so uh, I, I followed them. We started three weeks ago. In fact, we had been to uh, so many areas before we went finally to this particular uh, forest. Uh, we went to Odumto. Odumto is uh, in the Amansia Central District, deep within the uh, forest enclave, uh, where we also saw uh, similar destruction in, in that uh, bush. Um, we went to Kobro, where we have been three years ago, and we saw a further degradation of the environment by the same company we flashed out um, three years ago, and uh, the, the same Chinese people who are still working there. And so uh, there we saw some military as well. And the same commander we met this time around was the same commander with some military people in that push. That was uh, three weeks ago. There, the Chinese we arrested, some calls came in and were asked to leave the place. The Chinese were released by the same military commander we met at this particular uh, site. So we had to leave them there to uh, do their job. We came back uh, and went to this place, uh, Tabosre in the western region. There too, uh, we saw this degradation. So just uh, this Saturday, uh, this past Saturday, the team decided to go to this area because we, then we have received calls from people in the area, community leaders, that they were destroying the forest and they want them uh, flashed out, but uh, we, should, we should come over there. So we woke up like 3 a.m. and we set off. It was a very long journey, about 70 kilometers deep within the uh, forest and cave. When we got to the middle of the forest, we saw this settlement made with wood. And initially, we saw Ghanaian, uh, you know, Ghanaians there, a few of them, about uh, 12 of them. But as soon as they saw us, they ran into the bush. Then we saw some Chinese as well. Some of them ran into the bush. Uh, we, we managed to arrest about seven of them. Then the leader of the team, uh, who is a, a police officer, started conducting a search. So with our camera team, we're following the search team room by room. So we're conducting the search room by room and filming everything. So in three of the rooms, we saw that there were military uniforms with name tags. In some of the rooms, we saw rifles, uh, military rifles in, in the room. And so we quickly sensed that there could be military present uh, in the room. As you saw me in the video, those of you who have watched it, um, narrating. Then about 30 minutes into our search, there was this young military officer who uh, drove a private Tundra vehicle into the uh, uh, enclave. Then he inquired as to why we were there. And after the uh, person in charge had briefed him, he started making some calls uh, to some superiors. He mentioned their name in the we, part of it we recorded in our report. Mm. And so, and, and the person making, and the person in charge you are referring to is a police officer. Yes, it's a police officer. All right. So he started making those calls and telling them that um, we are here in the hot duties and some media men and policemen have come here. So uh, he wanted the person to react. Then within about 30 minutes, the whole place was crawling with military men. In fact, I could count about 30 of them armed with bulletproof vests and everything you can think of, fully armed. They came in white pickups. Some of them came in Tundra vehicles. Some of them came by other vehicles. And they came with these heavily built men. Some I know to be part of the Delta Force team that went to the court and all that. Mm. So when they came in, they were very furious, very angry that uh, even when the in charge interviewed, uh, introduced the team, 
that were from the Ministry of Environment and that we've been sent to uh, look at what is happening in there, they wouldn't buy. They still said that the person who is mining there has legal uh, uh, right to mine, and so they will not allow us to arrest the Chinese people. They released them, and then they took their things, the things, the uh, uniforms that we put in the vehicle, they took them back. Everything we seized from that end, they saw that we returned all of them. In fact, I would say that they told our team to stand down and then surrounded the whole enclave and said nobody was leaving the place until they finished and they were satisfied that they are done with us before we could leave. So it turned into verbal exchanges, heated verbal exchanges. Some of them threw punches, especially the heavily built men threw punches with some members of the task, uh, task force. Then they came to us and said they needed us to surrender the camera. And I said, no. At this point, one of the heavily built men came in, wrestled with my camera technician. The camera fell down and part of it broke. Then they took the camera. Then I asked my driver to park well because there was a vehicle which was approaching. Quickly, one of the heavily built men rushed into the front of the vehicle, punched the driver, started kicking me in the chest, and took the key from the ignition. So, in fact, at this point, I was protesting that they, they cannot assault him like that, all under the watch of the military. Then they came in, smashed the, the, the same guy, smashed the windscreen of the vehicle. Then I told my people to stay in the vehicle, and nobody should move. And they broke the side mirrors. That was when we had... We were done with them and they allowed us to leave. Then one of the heavily built men came in with a pump action gun and used the bat to hit the mirror. What he said was, kind of money to help you watch it. Like, don't ever come here again. Then he smashed the side mirror. Okay. Then the military came in, asked us to uh, delete the, the, the footage on the camera. In fact, I protested. The owner of the site was there. I protested, but he said they should delete it. So they took it, deleted everything from the camera. They took our personal phones, deleted everything from our personal phones as well. So they said they were not satisfied. They still think that we were hiding something uh, in the vehicle. So they wanted to strip us and search, uh, uh, conduct a body search and search the vehicle as well. So it was at this point that the... A uh, policeman in charge got angry and said that, well, I will not allow you to do that to them. So if you want to do that to them, they should get on board the vehicle. If you want to kill us, kill us. So we got on board the vehicle. They had blocked the entrance to the forest. So they had to remove their vehicles and the wood they've used to block the entrance before we could make it out. Mm. Uh, do we have any updates on these developments apart from the statement issued by the military command here in Accra uh, saying that there is going to be an investigation? Well, we've been, uh, I was contacted by three military officers. Uh, they identified themselves as coming from the military intelligence. Uh, they came to my office, uh, we spoke to my editor, and they interviewed me. Uh, statements from me. They said they were going to uh, contact me. They have to get, uh, in fact, after that interview, some of them have been calling you know, to clarify one, two, or three. That's it. But then we've also been served. I think you know that already. Um, yeah. Uh, let's let's not talk itself. about it. Let's not talk yeah. about it. The, yeah. the, the private uh, mining company has taken up a suit against Erastos Multimedia and has uh, secured an injunction on their blind side ex parte for 10 days, uh, preventing the airing of the footage. As you can see, we are not showing any footage. We are talking about what went on. We are not showing any footage because it has been injuncted. But Unfortunately, I don't know what use that injunction is because the footage had already been uploaded long ago before the injunction came. Uh, so that's, that will be all about it. Uh, Erastos, 
there cannot be an alternative to bold, independent, and fearless journalism. We know you are risking your life, even as you identify some of the people involved, but that is what we have to do for this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samson. Right. Okay. So, um, I said I would speak to Clara before I came to you guys, but let me start with you, uh, Dominic Ayena. Yes. How does this come to you? The military uh, high command issues a statement and they say that uh, the Ghana Armed Forces has in recent days taken notice of media reports alleging that some of its personnel have been involved in providing security for illegal mining operations. Uh, they take such allegations seriously and they don't condone wrongdoing if true. Accordingly, a full-scale uh, investigation has commenced into the allegations and appropriate sanctions will be handed out to any persons, person or persons found culp culpable. They assure the general public of their unflinching commitment to the national cause. Signed, E. Agrikwashi, Colonel, Director of Public Relations. <laughs> uh, something, this is, uh, I, I watched the, there is in the reportage by Erasmus. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's on Eras, YouTube. Eras, yeah, Eras, uh, Erastus. Erastus, mm. as I don't go. And I must commend him very highly for his bravery um, and the risk that he took, you know, in the public interest. Uh, what surprises me about this is that this was a task force um, of the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation which means that the government itself was monitoring and seeking to enforce, you know, compliance with uh, the ban on Galamse mm. and illegal mining. And uh, as a, Erastos was just, I mean, a, a journalist, you know, on that task force uh, that was uh, monitoring the activities of illegal miners in the, in, the for, in, the, in the forest. So I would have thought that the minister in charge of that ministry would have taken a strong position on what transpired. Okay, it must be a multi-agency mm. approach. Because he was invited he as was, a media house yes. to join them. To join them, yeah. all right. So yes, there can be, because of the role of the soldiers, there can be an investigation by the Ghana military because obviously from everything that happened, the soldiers were there to protect the conduct of an illegal activity. Because from what you yourself have said, I don't know whether you have verified it, um, the mining company does not have the requisite license. I don't know whether it is a, a prospector's license they don't have or a mining, I mean, an actual mining. Yeah, what we are told is that it's a prospecting license they have. Okay. Yeah. Now, so mm -hmm. prospecting licenses under the Minerals and Mining Act allow you to conduct very limited activity to determine the prospectivity of a mining site. All right you are not supposed to undertake actual mining. But from the footage that I saw, this went beyond just prospecting for gold to determine the prospectivity of the area. So I believe that criminality has occurred. The ministry should take a very strong stance on this, on this matter. And maybe a ministerial you know, uh, committee can be set up to investigate the matter so that uh, you know, the requisite sanctions are imposed. Rather than the military investigating it, the, it officers. The officers also need to be investigated and properly sanctioned. Okay, but as I said, we need to take you know, a multi-agency approach to this matter. And, and, and also- Dr. It, Dr. Ine, to have as many as 30 military men at one site will not be a decision by a gang of, you know, Army officers. I, I do. I do agree with you. Mm -hmm. I do agree with. You. I, I believe that this was, uh, you know, done, you know, with the um, what do we call it? The, official blessings. Uh, yeah, official the blessings of uh, people higher up and so on. Because I cannot see how the you know the military command structure would not know that they have thirty men stationed in the forest, you know, and protecting you know the conduct of mining activity by a private company. But the worrying aspect of it, something is that there is a, I mean, a, a growing trend of Chinese miners coming into this country, using our local people as fronts, you know, incorporating companies and conducting mining in the name of providing mine support services. 
all right? And then, you know, sharing the profits with, uh, you know, the local men. But the, uh, the, the manner in which it is being done does not um, augur well for purposes of, first of all, environmental regulation, okay? The, you know, payment of royalties, the payment of taxes and so on. So at the end of the day, it is this country that is going to lose. Mm. Because these, you know, Chinese people who come in, when they extract the gold, okay, they take it out through illegal routes. Mm. Yeah, so, um, um, uh, so uh, Clara, I have the benefit of knowing that the military actually sometimes is able to get into private contracts with mining companies or concessions, and then they will provide military men to go and do uh, offer guard, you know, protection duties. I think the question that is arising is, should we, the citizens, be funding a critical installation like the army to be doing this job by private contracts? Um, Samson, the issue when it comes to uh, our many issues with mining, I often don't even know where to start because sometimes I, it looks like the way we even identify the problem or diagnose the problem itself is problematic. Of course, it's, it's I mean, it's, di it's difficult to appreciate how any private person can enter into private contract with our military for private services from the military. And once, whilst this goes on, the military has a hierarchy, it has leadership. What is happening? Who is responsible for, 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 for the military and who is responsible for those um, um, providing the services? And what is, happen what, is, what is the person doing about that? Mm. One of the issues, yes, we, we are often quick to say the Chinese um, are doing this, the Chinese are doing that. The, but the truth is, this is not a Chinese problem. It's a Ghanaian problem. Mm. So I think we have to start acknowledging that it is not a Chinese problem. It is a Ghanaian problem. And if we, we, we admit that it is a Ghanaian problem, let's acknowledge what the problem is. What is happening in the mining in industry, I always get, find it quite disappointing when I hear the word task force being used in, in respect of dealing with problems arising from the mining sector. And why do I say this? It's because mining is a regulated activity. It's not like any other business activity in the country. This is a regulated sector. So you have various institutions um, set up to deal with the regulation and make sure that the proper thing is done uh, um, at, at the mining side. Over the years, what, what have these institutions been doing? So we, if there are problems with respect to regulation, two things. We are either looking at where the problem is coming from. Is it a, a legislative problem? Is it an enforcement problem? Or it is both? Yes, mining is about economics, but the economics is governed by law and enforcement. So what is the problem that, and what is required to solve the problem that we have not been doing? I think this, the, the long-term solution to this is to work through the regulators, through the particular institutions and see whose job is to do what, and is the person doing the job or not? As for the military, I don't, I don't even have the words to, to say when I hear that we have soldiers um, providing services to um, um, companies in terms of mining. I am not sure that those soldiers are, for example, equipped with the technical expertise to determine the content of a company's license, what they are supposed to do, what they are not supposed to do, are their activities legal, are they not legal, what aspects of their activities are legal or not. But then again, soldiers, these are soldiers, are, these soldiers are not just um, like people who incorporate a business that you can go and engage. This mm. is a, nat a national institution. So it's properly structured. Mm. The only solution to that is looking at the structure. Whose job is to, 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 to enforce and make sure that soldiers do what they are supposed to do or those, that soldiers don't get involved in certain um, um, civilian um, activities. So it's... Uh, yeah, I, the, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling I really I don't really want to talk about this. Yeah, the, so, 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 I think so we've the, been talking, talking, and so really the, not doing so, much. It looks as if so. The Ghana Armed Forces says it has commenced investigations into this. That that should be sufficient, isn't it? Because they say they will not condone uh, wrong. Well, 
Well, I, I don't know if it is sufficient to say we have commenced investigations. I thought this should be quicker, given that uh, the, the, the military is a, a, a very structured institution. I don't think we need a lot of, I don't think if we really want to get to the bottom of the issue, we wouldn't be able to, yes, we would need investigations, but this, I don't think this is one of the things we probably need to sit and then have certain long processes, a, a, a committee here and a committee there, and then probably after a long while, we, we don't get to hear anything. But yeah. largely as a country, I think we have to have a, an, an honest conversation with ourselves. What do we want to do with our mining sector? I think we should be honest enough with ourselves as to exactly what we want to do mm. so that we can find a way forward and stop destroying ourselves. All right. Uh, Samuel Abujinapo, the minister designate for lands and natural resources, suggests that uh, this is an area where he's been commanded by the president to pay attention to if parliament confirms him. Let's see how it goes. But you see, uh, Dr. Koboy, when it comes to issues like this, I don't want anybody to tell me you are supposed to be impartial. Just ask the questions and go away. <laughs> I am involved. My children are involved. Listen, the, the Ghana Water Company and this state has told us that in five, ten years, we are going to import water. I don't want my kids to import water if this does not stop. And our environment, virgin forest, is being raped in such a manner the president actually put his presidency on the line. So when you hear Erasto say that this particular entity had been flashed out in the earlier operation, what, what does it say to you? It's absolutely clear that the president still holds dear the fight against um, unsafe um, illegal mining. And when you listen to him, the last time, I think our caucus had the opportunity to meet the president. And he said that, look, yes, there are, there are folks who voted against some of our MPs because they feel that we have come too hard at them when it comes to unsafe mining. But what the president said was that once the, his objective is noble and his intentions are right, he's not going to back down on this fight against unsafe illegal mining just because it's, go, it's costed at some seats or it's make, it can make him unpopular with some people. So really, if you get close to him, this, this is a, a leader who believes strongly, like you're saying, that we can't allow our water bodies to be destroyed. We can't allow our forests to be destroyed. The quality of air we breathe depends on the vegetation we have and all that. But something, because we use human infrastructure to deal with problems, and uh, like your friend from CDD said, there are people who are susceptible to influence. It's, it's a fact that al along this fight, we've had very noble people who are coming, patriots who are fighting for the nation. Also, we've had people who have lent themselves to, how do you call it, um, influence and all that. So I don't discount or throw away uh, comments that suggest that someone along the chain might be frustrating the efforts of uh, the leader, I mean the president. Of course, his thoughts and his um, uh, motives are what most of us also hold on to. Mm. So, I think bottom line, that commitment is still there. And we have to find ways to expose those who is, make those is objectives. Anybody, yeah. anybody demanding some accountability yeah. and explanation <laughs> from the military high yeah. command. I mean, the president, yeah. the president yeah. is the commander in chief. Yeah. Yeah. Now it clearly yeah. on, on the face of it. Yeah not possible yeah. that those officers will just get up, pick their <laughs> rifles, and go and sit in a forest yeah. to protect an yeah. entity. That's it, you know. so, yeah. so we need to know. Already, uh, speculations are rife. Yeah. Yeah. There are people actually you know, circulating some yeah. uh, write-up suggesting yeah. that this was... Uh, a small group, you can't call them a contingent, right? Yeah. That was sent there, there are about 35 or so, that was sent there for a day's operation. Uh, it was supposed to be a day's operation. Yeah. Then the, the suggestion is that 
going for a day operation, a day's operation, tend to be months and is going into for a long time. Yes. And they ended up rather protecting, yeah. if, uh, you know, this kind of stuff rather than doing what may, <clears throat> they would have been doing in the interest of the nation. Uh, Samsi, you know, I've known you for a long time, so I'm not one of those people who attack your intents or your genuineness when it comes to the issues. But the point is that because uh, multimedia has done this work, the intention might have been noble, and your colleague is involved. Uh, you have some interesting <laughs> small bias. Mm. And bias doesn't mean your opinion is wrong. My yeah. bias but, is to the country. Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. Mm. Yeah. So, but the point I want to make is that um, when you are involved, like in your case, and you even are privileged, like you said, to some military stuff, there is the tendency to maybe go ahead of maybe the investigations and have some oh, conclusions. On, on, I mean, on, the, on the contrary, let me, yeah. let me say this. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. But I think that what something is doing here is a continuation of yeah. the journalistic yeah. inquiry. I get it. Okay, so that we can get to the bottom of it. Uh, I mean, if, you know, if, 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 I mean, Council, I don't have a problem. If yes. you were, let's say, if they were doing the program. So, so, yeah. so put more oh, no, 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 I'm yeah. asking, yeah, yeah. is the president calling somebody and asking them questions? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Should he be yeah. telling Ghanaians what, what went on yeah, so Even before yeah. they do what they say is no, an no. investigation. If, if something were having, let's say, there was a documentary on the work that has been done, mm. he's speaking to what he knows and all that, that is okay. But because we are on this platform mm -hmm. where he's moderating, that's I want to say that. I give it to him when he goes that line. But the bottom line is that for someone like me, I would like to look, wait for the facts. I mean, this is a rendition that has come from our brother. We want the, some independent, it can be the military or some other body to tell me that, okay, we went into it. But also, note, the, also yeah. note that he was an invitee, yeah. okay, yeah. of the government, okay, of the I state. It. Okay, I get it. The state had a, an environmental sustainability <clears throat> task force. Absolutely. Then they were going to do their work, but they needed media. I, you I, know that all the time they are taking the media I, with I, them. No, yeah. Okay. I take that yeah. board. But, yeah, uh, but yeah. let, let me say that, let me say that, what I can speak to, I mean, uh, confidently, is that because the president is very serious and passionate about this safe mining thing to protect our environment, I am absolutely sure that definitely he will be making the necessary calls and contacts to appreciate what really happened beyond the investigation that has occurred. That I am certain about. Okay. No, All but, right. But I must also mm. say something about uh, the motives of the president. Yeah. Mm. Okay, because uh, um, yes, he put his presidency on the line, yeah. um, saying that uh, he, you know, he, and he actually lost some seats. Right. Some seats because but you see, you didn't lose the seats yeah. only on account of the fact that you were hard on the, the Galam says. Yeah. You also lost seats on account of the fact that How after been, taking the, 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 recent, the mining sites from yeah. the Galam say, the Galam say operators, all right, um, persons with connections in government yeah. took over those. Yeah and started operating there. And, and, that, and, that, and that from what I am seeing on social media, it, it appears that people, are, people think that this is one of the sites being operated by kingpins of the government. Let's wait for it. All right, that. and let's, let's you know, as something said, as a commander in chief, yeah. probably the, president, the first person the president should fire is his army commander. That, and, but, and let's remember also uh, that, leader, let's remember also, they, let's remember they, also that it is fair yeah. to defer to the journalist who actually identifies yeah. Delta Force members, members. within yeah. the, the heavily built people who were part of the army in the. Uh, in that's that what place. I'm saying that we have mm. to wait for the. the All right. And then okay. we can make definitive statements on them. But there was a little bit of propaganda mm. from your end. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you very much. I will return to share some of your messages with you. When we come back, we will spend just some 10 minutes to deal with the ministerial appointment. We're asking question whether the president is doing 85 by compulsion because of the outcome of the elections or genuinely he has learned from the criticism that his government was over super bloated and justifiably by 126 ministers for a poor country like Ghana. We'll be right back.
You're welcome back. This is News Files, your most authoritative news analysis platform. It's brought to you by the sponsorship of Bank of Africa, as strong as a, a group and close as a partner. MTN, everywhere you go. Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Heaven, mosquito, spray and coil, pleasant on humans. Tough nightmare on insects. And Napa Foods, it's tasty. DBS Industries, Robert and Sons, seeing is believing. And Duraplus, where Duraplus goes, water flows. <laughs> now, some of your comments. This one says, I have credible information suggesting that some people coming into the country through the airport pay for the test but use a private route to leave the airport without taking the test. This is serious. I know of two such people. Please investigate. Okay, you have a duty to. So these people you know, report to them. Okay? That's, that's your duty as a citizen. Uh, Godwin Agbako. The time for conversation is long gone. Time to act is now. Nanakufuado she stop playing the ostrich and tackle the menace head on. The report of water shortage in the near future doesn't give us the luxury of time for those tea conferences. Okay, that is uh, Mike J, is it? If someone can engage our military without the knowledge of the military high command and the commander in chief of the um, official, okay, then this country is not safe. This is from uh, Tilata. Okay, thank you very much. So the statement that they issued should first have told us something. Say, yes, we have stationed military officers <laughs> at this area, they are doing this, but this is a very nebulous statement, only saying, assuring us of an investigation. The president is the commander in chief of the Ghana Armed Forces. 30 military men at a site. 30 power. What does this tell you? Charles Reco Brobe. Um, this one says, I'm surprised by your disclosure that you know that the military take private contracts to protect Galamse operations. What is the legal basis? Where is the CIC? Okay, I don't understand that. So why are you surprised? I know for a fact that they do. I actually have one of those contracts they entered with a, a company. That's not to say that company was engaging uh, illegal mining. Okay. Um, Papa J Jr. This is serious. Disgrace to the commander in chief of the military of the country. If the discussion is true about the military. Okay. Um, we didn't show because, as I said, there's an injunction that says we shouldn't show it anymore. But if you went to YouTube, you'll find it. <laughs> um, right. Now, now let's quickly look at what the president is seeking to do. Um, the, he has um, named a number of people. He's uh, cutting down on the ministries. Uh, removing as many as seven, right? And then he's uh, merging some of them. And then the ministers, he's going to have not more than 85. Question, is this voluntary? Having listened to civil society and Ghanaians, or it is um, because the elections outcome have compelled him? Yes. Uh, Dr. Kuboy, we start with you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the president in his first term had um, about 126 uh, ministers of state. state. Um, let's say about um, mm -hmm. today as we speak, uh, there's been clear communication from the presidency that we're going to have maximum 85 ministers of state. Mm. 
I mean, from 126 to 85 is very significant. He's beating his own record. Why should we applaud yes. him for it? Yeah, but... but uh, his own unparalleled record. Uh, absolutely. Mm. I, I, I am saying it's significant because there are two things that have happened here. First of all, um, we've had ministries, like when you take the regional reorganization and development, mm. that have more or less executed the objective for which they were set up. You know, the engagement. That's, that's another question. Oh, okay. I mean, but, <laughs> but that is, I'm, I'm speaking to the motive behind right. what we are seeing. Right. Where they've, they've done, they've been able to uh, go through the processes with us. We had a referendum, the six regions have come on board. Mm. And in terms of sustenance and their development, it can come down under, it can be absorbed under the local government ministry. If you look at inner city and Zongo development, for example, um, this is a ministry that uh, had special focus on our Zongo communities. Mm. And the Zongo Development Fund was set up, the legislation came to parliament and all that. Now, that is the main implementer of their projects, with the minister or the ministry be, uh, more or less being the policy uh, advisor. The minister, Dr. Mustafa Hamid, had been very emphatic yeah. that that ministry, no government, no president will yeah. ever collapse it. Yeah. In fact, before coming here, knowing how meticulous you are, I spoke to him. Mm. <laughs> and and, and well, what he said was that, look, he says that as an entity, as a, cre a, a creature, it will not go away. As we speak, that Zongo Development Fund, which will run which runs their projects, the execution level, the operation level, is coming now under the presidency, with the president being the supervisor. So it's even a greater uh, level that it's been taken to. Really? Uh, yes, and that it's not... Ma Malik, Malik Dabu interviewed yeah. him on that occasion, yeah. and he was very emphatic that that ministry... But, but uh, more important, I want to speak to mm. the, the, the rationale behind the shrink. All right. Uh, because the Zogo Development Fund has been set up the ministry had the momentum to put all this together. Now it could come under the presidency and not necessarily exist in a building somewhere as an independent ministry. Now, if you take a special one, like the special development initiatives, their key objective was to set up the development authorities because they were not meant to be implementing an implementing ministry. Mm. The authorities must take charge of the development of their zones. And as we speak, it's gone through parliament, everything is set up. So the so president's is, justifications for these bloated numbers were correct right. because you actually need a ministry yeah. to to, uh, to ensure yeah. that these uh, development agencies are set up. Sometimes you are not patient enough. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, other, the, the, the point I'm coming to answer your, your mm. question. Mm. I think there's a second one. So we have the issue of redundancy or ministries having more or less their momentum having put into motion what was needed. Then the other one is the issue of comments and uh, 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 statements most of them, if not all, well intended about the size of government. So, look, you have a situation where you have a president who has no immediate gains that he will get from actually reducing the size of his government now. If politically he wanted points, someone say he would have done that maybe six months or one year to an election. But even when he's had a second term as a person, he still feels that, look, and these were his comments. I mean, uh, we, a caucus, we met him, and he said, look, you as a government, you must be seen to be sensitive to the opinions of your people. You After they have punished you oh, so much. Oh, but look what, um, um, uh, lawyer, you can write an exams, score 70%. But there are times you sit down to see what made you lose that 30%. It doesn't mean that your situation is hopeless. You just want, as a human being, you always want to make progress. Mm. You want to be more appealing and attractive to your base. So I'm being honest with you. This is a president who is being frank, who appreciates and is aware that there were some who meant well, who said the size of government was an issue. And why not? Why do you lead? You lead a people because you want them to feel that their opinions are respected. And most importantly, they matter. The brain is not only in your head. So um, I think that uh, from 1 to 26 to 85, uh, he's found a very innovative way. And that's what criticism does. It makes you innovative to achieve the same purpose by using a different route. So now as you speak, planning has gone to finance. You have a, a special business development having gone to, what's the name, trade and industry. It's because the criticisms and opinions, and as a leader who is sensitive, he's, he's bought into it, and he's doing what the Ghana people want. At the end of the day, I'm happy that the Zongo Development Fund, for example, will not be thrown away. You are going to have a coordinator at the presidency. 
we are achieving same objectives with a leaner a, 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 a size of government mm. that is more acceptable to people like uh, well, it, it's, not, it's not acceptable to everybody really. Uh, yeah. There are CSOs that still think that this is bloated okay. uh, because, you know, when Kufour was not happy that yeah. it was big, later he came, he realized yeah. there was a difference. Yeah. Atamils gave us about uh, 70 yeah. plus. Yeah. We still had problems. We still had problems. Just, yeah. still had Just, problems. One, sentence. Just um, one sentence. Yeah, so, is, so there are those including uh, Kofi Bento, Ramsford Jampo, yes. and yes. some CSOs that say that Maybe we need a sort of a Trump yeah. in Ghana yeah. who will change the status quo yeah. to teach us that yeah. we really can do it only 40 ministers. Something. Um, I, 40 I've heard ministers. Those, I've heard and that would be enough. Uh, you see, I've heard those arguments. And the parliament yeah. might not need the hand, 100. You don't Sometimes, even need that. Know, when I was doing my master's program in public health in Germany, one of my lecturers made a statement. He's always encouraged me. He said that the usefulness of the master student is to ask questions. He said, you are not here to be taught. In everything, find criticism. Mm. So I am one that is very accommodative of criticism. The fact that the president has moved from one to six to uh, 85, and people still have issues, you tell you that it's a vibrant community. Yeah. Mm. But what I want those people to do is to at least give some plaudits, tell the person, you've done well by moving from one to six to 85, that is commendable. Mm. And then move the next step if you want to say that, Okay, you can even go down. For okay, it. thank you. That is now, now, why should anybody say, well done for it's taking us... No, it, it, it's not really <laughs> about that. <laughs> why should somebody say, <laughs> well done, well done for being in opposition and telling us that John Mahama had a big government, okay? Of how many? 80 what? 87, we are told. We had 87. And then you come in and from day one, from day one, you assemble up to so many and you justify it from day one till the end. Yeah. You said the end will justify the means. Why should anybody be applauding the president? Yeah, with, with all due respect to uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Okoboy, I, I think that the president's actually latest action, you know, of reducing the number of ministers, <coughs> is born out more out of compulsion than, you know, listening to public opinion and respecting public opinion. Because as you rightly pointed out, for four years, the issue of the bloated nature of his government was on the front burner, all right? It was discussed, you know, I mean, uh, copiously, you know, in the media. Um, there were a lot of, rep I mean, representations by uh, civil society organizations and so on, okay? Uh, the president didn't see it fit at that point in time to realign ministries. And for instance, in the case of Zongo development, abolish the ministry and say, okay, we are appointing a coordinator who will administer the Zongo development uh, fund. And in the case of special in initiatives, okay, he could have just come to parliament to create the development agencies, appoint chief executives and officers who will man those, uh, you know, I mean, agencies. Um, he waited for four years and then got punished by the electorate. In fact, one of the, the key issues during the election was the bloated nature of the government. And something, the reason why he has done this it's very obvious, and you know it. Article uh, 78 of the Constitution is very clear that um, you have to appoint, I mean, a, a majority of your ministers from parliament. Now, a majority means more than 50%. Okay. If that is the case, with 127 ministers, Akuva, Nana Akuvado would have needed to appoint about 69 people out of parliament. Now, if you take 69 out of 127, how many people are left in parliament to be able to man, you know, the, the MPP caucus, I mean, uh, in, in parliament effectively, and then assume leadership roles and so on. So this is as a result of a pragmatic assessment of the implications constitutionally, you know, of having to deal with a large number of people coming from parliament. Okay, and, and, and that is how come that they have now brought it down to, I mean, uh, to, to 85. So if you are doing... Um, 50% or more than, slightly more than 50% of 85, you are looking at what, 43 people coming out of parliament. That is more manageable than having to take about 69 people out of parliament. So I think that this is, you know, as a result of uh, the president's, um, you know, the constitutional strictures mm. that he has, uh, you know, um, done, I mean, uh, done it this way. Now, at this point in time, all right, the president is a dead good. Right, he is oh, a proper dead good. Oh, I mean, yeah, no, he's a dead good in the sense that 
Okay, I, I mean, he is not seeking re-election. Okay, so ordinarily, if he had gotten the massive um, electoral fortune that he had in the first term, do you, do you think that the parliamentary majority, if he had 120 people elected to parliament, do you think that Nana Rodanko Akufado would have given us 85 ministers? I, I mean, I doubt it. He would have probably, you know, stuck to the 126 or even gone further. So no. I don't think that, I don't think that. Okay, let's hear, let's hear, uh, let's hear uh, Clara. The, the, the yes, uh, Clara, you, you are with the CDD and uh, the CDD has not been excited about this. So now that it is reduced, you should be happy. You should be clapping for the president. <laughs> it's a question. Of course, um, the, uh, of course, it was obvious a lot of people didn't want um, um, the huge numbers. And that um, lean government helps, particularly in the fight against corruption, because uh, big government is associated with more opportunity, lean government, at least in terms of control and reducing opportunity for corruption, it's, lean government does better. So yes. The issue of the number of ministers was a big issue. And yes, I think it's, it's, it's good that um, it's been reduced to 85. As to the reasons here and there, I am not going to make, I don't know, but it's good. It's good that we have, um, the, the numbers have been reduced. Let's work towards um, reducing them some more. I can understand some of the difficulties, particularly um, um, that politicians would face. We can't run away from some of the realities as, as, as well. Um, that political parties and the pressure that is brought on any person who is who is who is um, pre who is occupying the presidency for appointments and all of that, we cannot run away from from that fact. So I think the the 85 is is, is, a, is a good improvement. I hope we never, under any circumstances, go um, uh, above it, and we hope that it will reduce. I was thinking that, of course, obviously from the report that, that has come out, it's a, it, it appears that some of the, we are likely to have some ministers having more than one deputy and all of that. So when after that, we will look at it. I can understand certain ministries needing one, more than one deputy. Attorney General is one of them. I think if you look at the constitutional role of the Attorney General's department, it's more or less combining at least three roles, which is you are the legal advisor of the of, of government, you are also in charge of criminal prosecutions, you are in charge of civil prosecutions as well, and then there's the administration bit. So if you look at an, a, a, a ministry like the Attorney General's Department, I think that having two deputies is reasonable if you are going to look at the scope of, of the work that is required of, of of, 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 of the, the Attorney General's Department. I'll have, I'll, I, however, think that there are probably even some ministries that may not even need a deputy. So I think as the days go by, we can look critically at it and see how we can reduce um, 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 our ministers further so that we have at least reduce our public. The, what, the, the what, 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 for example, um, is, a, is a, another deputy doing at the criminal department when you have a dpp the director of public prosecutions you don't need a deputy to do that and i was alone for four years i think it depends yes i think uh, um, um, you don't need a, a doctor dr Ayene is reminding us that he was alone as deputy for four years sorry dr Ayene reminds us that he was alone as deputy for four years so he can, he can contribute, he can let us know how that was for him. Does he think we need being alone was, was did it make his work easier or could he do it an extra hand? It would be good for us, at least somebody has been there before and is here. I think it would be good for us to know how um, he knows how it was there. He, he could tell us. He's simply what, saying, I, he's simply saying that once you have the DPP, yeah. don't, you don't need another deputy to go do criminal yeah. prosecution. And, and, and to add to that, you have the Solicitor General, mm -hmm. who is actually under the Legal Profession Act, okay, the highest civil servant after the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. And the tradition in the department is that the Solicitor General is in charge of civil litigation. Actually, I mean, we took that tradition from, uh, from the British. And you know that in the, U, in the U.S., for instance, it is the Solicitor General and not the Attorney General who appears before the U.S. Supreme Court to argue civil matters. Okay. And then the, 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 uh, the DPP. DPP, their version of the DPP, does a criminal amenity. So okay. what I basically did was to coordinate 
whatever they did under the supervision of my minister. Mm. And it was perfect. I, right. I don't think there's any. Okay, so uh, we draw the curtains on this subject here. We take a break and return to the Supreme Court. Chachu Chikata said that the court ought to be minded that they cannot sacrifice justice on the altar of expedition. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform brought to you by Bank of Africa, as strong as a group and close as a partner, MT, and everywhere you go, Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa, Duraplas, where Duraplas goes, water flows, heaven, mosquito spray, and coral pleasant on humans, tough nightmare on insects, and Napa Foods, it's tasty, DBS Industries. And it's also brought to you by Robert and Sons. Seeing is believing. And uh, Dr. Okoboy, Bernard Okoboy, um, has left us. And Gary Nemako Mafo, member, legal and constitutional committee of the New Patriotic Party, joins us. Thank you, Gary, for joining us. Thank you, my brother. Great. So uh, we're hoping that we would have a lot of time, but we have a very constrained time. So let's see how we are able to go about it. Beginning with uh, Dominic Ayene. So we are in the court, and now the media report, as we see, is that you are saying that your petition should stop. Is that, is that really what is going on? <laughs> I, I think uh, that is a layman's uh, um, conception of what is happening. But of course, as lawyers, we do know that at some point in time when, you know, um, there is a, a preliminary or interlocutory matter that is before the, the court. You can apply for proceedings to be stayed, which means that the court will not continue uh, with the trial until that matter is determined. Because in your view, that matter is so important to the trial itself, to the main trial itself, that you think that it should be determined before the trial goes. And in our case, it's because we have an, I, I mean, um, a review application that has been filed before the court, in which we are asking the court to take a second look at its ruling of the 19th of January that refused our application for interrogatories. Because we are saying that if you take the date that was fixed for the review, which is uh, the 28th you know, of uh, January, all right, that the, it is beyond the date of the trial. The trial is supposed to start on the 26th. And if we the supposing for a sake of argument that the Supreme Court, you know, um, takes a second look at this, uh, you know, 19th January decision and comes to the position that it was wrong um, and which we think it was. And uh, now says that we can administer the interrogatories, which are the, the set of questions that we want the Electoral Commission to answer. Then it will mean that we will have to take about two or three steps backwards. All right, have the Electoral Commission answer the interrogatories for us to then incorporate them into our evidence because you know that once they have been answered and filed, they are deemed admitted, okay? Mm -hmm. And they will, be, they will form part and parcel of our evidence going forward so that if we now have to revise our witness statements or some other documents that we're supposed to, I mean, uh, file, then we'll, ha we'll have to do that before we come back to the court. And so that is why we ask the court to stay proceedings pending the determination of the application for, for review. Mm. Okay, so, um, but I, I myself have been receiving calls from uh, lay people saying that you brought the petition and you are now saying that the court should halt and, uh, and not determine the petition. But that is as a result of uh, the PR machinery of our opponents <laughs> who are seeking to make us <laughs> make it look like we are, I mean, uh, not in control of what is happening in court. But of course, something you do know that um, the NDC as a, a, a party and uh, President Mahama as the petitioner uh, has put you know, our best foot forward. I mean, there are few lawyers as smart as Mr. Chachuchikata in this country and as experienced as he is. So the, the whole notion that, I mean, a, a legal guru of his stature does not know what he's about, even if Tachu doesn't know what he's about, at least, you know, uh, Dr. Ayeni knows what he's about. I taught Gary Nimako, I taught 
the, the deputy attorney general and so on, they cannot tell me that I do not know basic, you know, courtroom procedure pursuant to CI 16. I mean, I, I have practiced before the Supreme Court, you know, consistently for many years. There's no reason why anybody should give the impression that we are not knowledgeable of the procedures. We don't know what is happening. Mm. We are not prepared and so on. Yeah. In fact, we are super prepared and yeah. they are afraid <laughs> that if we go down the route that we want... The complaints, yes. Yes. the complaints, and as we hear the, the MPP team say, is that you seem to know you don't have a good case. Mm -hmm. And so you are just trying to put, you know, uh, stumbling blocks in the way to delay this process unnecessarily when the court has a 42 uh, days timeline. Um, um, two days. I, yeah, uh, I, no. I, I have in my hand a, a practical guide to civil procedure in Ghana written by one of the judges, Samuel Mafo Sal. And when it comes to what you're seeking to do, this is what you have been raising in the court. Basically, uh, he says that uh, this is a process which a party in an action may compel the disclosure of important documentary evidence in possession of the opponent to enable the party prepare sufficiently for the trial. Essentially, it is one of the pre-trial protocols offered by the rules to promote early disposal of cases. Now, discovery, interrogatories, is one of discoveries. But you see, in this uh, book, which he eloquently explains the process, yeah. He makes the point that what you are seeking must be relevant. Yes. Otherwise, the court, according to the rules, will not grant you. That is so. The court says what you are seeking is not relevant. That's why they've denied well, you. Well, why are you still going back with a, a review instead of proceeding to file your witness statements, file your arguments for the preliminary issue, and then the case can, can go on? It's something. The, 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 the statement that what we are seeking, you know, to from the... Um, you know, the Electoral Commission is not relevant. It's patently false. It's false because if you watch proceedings that day, Minister Chikada took time to take the court through all the 12 questions that he had, you know, filed to be administered to the, um, you know, the, uh, this in, to the Electoral Commission, the first respondent. Then also, and very importantly, the lawyer for the Electoral Commission, my own good friend, and I mean, uh, Justina Menuvo, all right, and, you know, on his feet, said that the answers we are seeking are found in their answer, mm -hmm. all right, which means that they are, relevant to, be they are relevant to be asking. They are relevant to the process, okay? He wasn't, he didn't say that, you know, nothing has been said in the pleadings regarding the questions we are asking. He said, the, the answers are found in the answers filed by the respondents. So why are we seeking these answers? Mm. But of course, if you have a very terse paragraph or two dealing with a matter, a party is at liberty to file interrogatories, you know, to ask you to expatiate, to ask you to provide more information for purposes of the conduct of the litigation. Now you have as many as seven judges. Yes. All of them come to one mind. Yes that what you are saying is relevant, it's not relevant. No. And again, as we understand, you have the opportunity <coughs> to raise these matters in the trial by way of cross-examination. Yeah. Why don't you do but, that? But you, you very well know that under, cro under cross-examination, all right, when you ask a question, it can be overruled, all right? So cross-examination as a mechanism for putting that information forward is weaker than the administration of interrogatories because once the answers have been provided by the respondent, and filed, they are deemed admitted. So it is very, very important for us, you know, to have these, I mean, uh, uh, answers. You see, what the respondents did, okay, especially the first respondent, was basically to narrate, narrate how they complied with the law, right? By, by I mean, uh, looking, by just taking the, the law itself and narrating the procedure. Our questions are designed to find out in actual fact what happened. That is very important. For so until, a, a so until they hear the review and give you their decision, you are not filing your witness statements and your preliminary uh, arguments? Because we have filed for stay of proceedings. Okay. Yes. 
So uh, that, that, is, that is the effect. If you are filed for stay, but the stay has not been heard yet. Yes, the stay will be heard. Mm. Um, if it is granted, of course, we will not be required to immediately file our witness statements. However, if it is <coughs> granted, then it means that the trial will, will, uh, will proceed as planned. Mm. But some, you know, there is something that I wanted to I mean, uh, uh, bring to your attention. Okay. You have just read... Get that quickly. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah you've just read the, um, you know, the portion from Justice Marfo's house book where he says that you know, interrogatories are designed in order to... Uh, um, to achieve speed. To achieve speed. Okay, so basically um, that is the constitutional or statutory basis of interrogatories. And I, I, I just wanted to refer you to the case of Abu Bakar and Yardua, all right, in which the Nigerian uh, you know, Supreme Court actually said that a denial of the right to file interrogatories, to administer interrogatories, is a denial of justice and a violation of the, cons the constitutional principle of a fair trial. That is very important. Ah, then why does the law make it a discretionary thing in the, in the rules so that a judge must consider all the factors to come to the conclusion that what you are asking is germane, is relevant before they give it? It's something that is good that uh, 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 Dr. Ine at least has taught some of us law. <laughs> and I think it's credit to him that some of his students are petitioners yeah. before the courts of Ghana. You see, like the justices said, the grant of interlocutory uh, uh, interrogatories, clearly it is very clear. It has to be relevant to the issues in contention. Now, if you look at the questions that were raised before the court, seven judges, not even one dissented, said the questions that you were asking is not relevant to the issues before the court. Now, some say look at the rules that the court is now using to apply now. The CR 99, which was spearheaded. But the Honorable Mrs. Marita Brew appeared upon. No, she didn't. <laughs> she didn't. So who mm. spearheaded it? No. The Rules of Court Committee did. She was just a member of the Rules committee, uh, of Court Committee. Fine. Yeah. And at that time, in 2016, I think this was post-election petition 2013. That's right. Where is, President Mahama made it very clear that election petition for eight months clearly affected his, 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 his governance. Now, the, 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 the essence of this year 99, if you look at it carefully, is expedition. It doesn't also mean that when the court is administering expeditious trial, the court will throw away all issues of substance and justice and then say, well, we're not going to deal with all procedures, we're not going to deal with interlocutory, we're not going to deal with anything, but rather we are just simply saying that, come along, whatever it is, we are going to deal with the matter within 42 days. That's not the matter. Mm -hmm. What is happening now is that in the course of dispensing justice, in the course of hearing the petition which you have brought before the court, the court must be guided by the application of CR 89. Now, do we really have a question in terms of the legibility of the election before the court, so to speak? No, no, validity, that's, that's, validity that's, so to speak. That's, that's, a, that's a different matter. All yeah. let, let, me, let me take that's us through. a different matter altogether. You see, right. you see, you see something. All the questions, you know, you know, a very important question. All the questions which they seek to ask Mrs. J. Mensa, they can be posed to her during the cross-examination. <laughs> now, you say it can be overruled. It can only be overruled if the question is not relevant to the matters in contention. Mm -hmm. How can the matter or an answer which is relevant to the trial be overruled by the court? It's not possible. It is only when it's not relevant to the issue, then it can be overruled. Yeah, do you, so do you then let me, see, let me, let me, let then me see yes. a certain danger? Yes. If asking it now is irrelevant, then asking it later, will that be relevant? Even your view, they say it's relevant to the issue, and therefore they file for review. My position is that that question can be put through the witness, and he has filed a witness statement. And clearly it means that Mrs. JMS is going to enter the box herself. No, this is the question I'm asking. Yes. Practically what they are seeking to do now, mm -hmm. you are saying they can do it later. If they now, find it relevant. Right. In their view. Now, if it's going to be irrelevant. Wait, wait, wait. If it is held to be irrelevant. Wait, wait. Instead of going to the route today, wait, wait, wait. will it be relevant Instead tomorrow? of going to the route, no, they are saying that mm. in their view. You see, you can put 10 lawyers in the room. Mm. Five may agree, five may disagree. I'm saying that if in their view, Respectfully, my, my professor finds that position relevant 
And for that reason, they fought for review. In application, they determined by seven justices. And they all said that, look, it is without merit, so we are throwing it away. In a review application, what manifest error has occasion? Oh. To the extent that you can say that all the seven justices, at least some or all, Mm. will change your mind. Uh, let's be careful not to determine that. No, I'm, 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 I'm yeah. just saying, 7-0. Seven, yeah. seven because mm. now they're going to bring two to make yes, it nine. Two more. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So, the nine <laughs> to Any, come. Anything can happen. Yeah. You, know, you know judges can change their mind after they have done. Where? You know, even in the high court, when we do a process, we can go back for a review before the same judge, and they will change their mind. Mm -hmm. you, you've done that. Yeah, but review, review now, I'm taking it from the, from the high court rules. No, I'm, I know, but I'm no, telling no, you no, that. It's no longer within the high court rules. What, no, I'm, no, what no. I'm saying, yeah. what I'm saying is, is to give you an example mm -hmm. that a judge, you, you and I have appeared before judges. Mm -hmm. They give a decision, and then we point out to them that they have made some error here or something, okay? And then we go back to the same judge mm -hmm. within seven days. And they change their decision. That is the single judge. Yes, single judge. This one, seven justices. You mean none of them got the right? Yes, they. I mean, none of them. None of them got the right. The seven a, justices. In a number of decided cases, which we have referred to copiously in our review application, the Supreme Court is well, in even situations where it has unanimously rendered a decision. Okay, has you know, I mean, um, um, reversed itself. Upon review. Okay. okay. Let's, uh, so that, look, right. look, 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 let's see, let, let, let's see how it goes. Okay. And you see, mm. I see clearly, so mm. I'm saying, there is a matter where I find so curious. We went through elections. In the elections, we were not told that uh, prior to the, 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 the ballot box being open, or when it was open, people are like putting you know, uh, materials in there. We were not told that in the counting processes, uh, somebody has, you know, altered some figures anywhere. We are not told that in the coalition processes, something on, on really has done, mm. has been meted to anybody. We were, we told, are not told, you were told that. Well, yeah. In the coalition processes? Yes, we were yes. told. We're in told the coalition? Went yes. Wrong. Yeah. The presidential. Yes. And, and I, think, I think that is where you people are afraid. Mm. No, let, 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 him, let, okay. him, let him finish, yeah. You see, you see. <laughs> but, but you know something, Gary. You see, in the 2013 mm. uh, petition, if you read the judgment, there were matters that the NPP, uh, as in Nanado and his uh, colleagues, yes. raised, but they abandoned during the trial, mm -hmm. like padding and other issues. They abandoned them during the trial. So is it not fair to allow a party to raise their issue and proceed? Oh, Let's can, see how it ends. You can raise the issue. That is the reason why they must allow the trial process to go on. Mm -hmm. It should go on. Now, now, now the issue has already been raised. Five issues, I believe. Yes, yes, okay. five. And the roadmap has been drawn up. But to us, now, it's a wrong roadmap. Mm. Well, if it's a wrong roadmap, what about it? And, and a very unfair you, 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 Well, you, you said that you have filed, you have filed an, uh, a, a, a review application yes. and then filed for a stay of, of, of proceedings okay, yeah. pending the hearing of your, of your review and the determination of your review. Which is on the 28th. On the 28th. Mm. So we will wait. And let the court, the seven justices now add two to make it nine, and then come and deal with the review. Yeah. And then they stay. And then we see how it goes. Right. But let, the, let me bring in the, Clara. Yes. Um, uh, Clara, I, I don't know what you have to say about this aspect of what has transpired in the courtroom. Uh, but in addition, the John Mahama team's complaint is that when you are doing a case management conference, lawyers are supposed to make inputs. But in this case, the judges just took their memorandum of issues, sat in the closet, agreed, and came forward and imposed everything on them. Um, are they right by suggesting that this is unheard of? Um, Samson, when it comes to, because there's a review application in court, and also a stay of, uh, a, a a stay of proceedings, um, um, application in court that is yet to be heard. I would hold my comments on 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 that until the rulings are given. Okay, so I, the I, procedure I, because the, these are matters that are being contested. I must say that no, I no. Okay, I so what is being contested? What is being contested, also, Clara? What is being sorry. contested is not the uh, directions, the case management. I'm asking you the question about the case management, yes, where they say that case management conferences. As we know, standard, lawyers contribute, and they were not given the opportunity to contribute as to 
anything. And I'm asking the question, is it unheard of that, particularly in the Supreme Court, that the, the court itself cannot look at your memorandum of issues and come and tell you this, these are the ones we have picked, these are the ones we have merged or we have tweaked, and this is uh, the number of days you use, go and bring your witness statement without consulting with you? Is it unheard of? The, Samson, it would be unfair to say a yes or no whether something is unheard of. Because to be fair to all sides, when you are doing a case and you are in court, it is your, your, your satisfaction or complaint is not whether what has happened is unheard of or not, but is whether or not what has happened in court should have happened or not should ha it shouldn't have happened. So it will, I, I, I wouldn't want to comment um, right at the moment on whether it is unheard of or it is not unheard of because I don't think there's value to it's always like when somebody asks me um can i can i go to court and say this and i'm always like of course you can go to court and say anything you like it is whether what you have said uh, should is something that should be taken or not be taken is the issue but not whether or not um, um you can say of so whether it's unheard of or not it's not for Ma me it's Ma not Maretta, for me Maretta Brewer, it's Pia, Maretta, the circumstances in this particular case with this mm. fact what would have been the best thing to do Maretta Brewer, Pia, uh, who is with the john mahama team granted an interview and asked the question which uh, dominic ayene also uh, sort of confirmed to the media she asked the question According to the timelines, the schedule provided by CI-99, there are two days for case management. Uh, five days, actually. Five days for the case management conference. So they ask the question, what is the hurry? What's your, what do you say about that? Because they feel that if it's case management, the law allows them five days. Well, again, it, that is still, uh, if you are looking, that doesn't really um, um, answer much. It's, it's not an issue of what is the hurry or what is not the hurry. Of course, if we are going to, are we within the rules? Is it, does it aid the process if we do this? Those are some of the things that we, we, we look at. But uh, no, I didn't listen to her interview, I, sh I, I should say. But then again, like I said, I don't really think that um yeah. 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 You know, I, a, I, me commenting on such a comment would have any <laughs> value on the discussion because yeah. there's more to it there are more nuances um, um and, and than what appears okay when, when trial yeah. is being done in uh, in the open like this where it's on tv i i'm always should i say sympathetic to all lawyers because you are never in it's, it's not very easy for either lawyer in, in in this case you take instructions for your client nobody knows what the instructions you hold but everybody thinks of how the case should be handled it is only you who know the complete set of facts you are working with what your clients instructions are mm. and you are doing it to the best of your ability so All when right. it comes see, to this um, i wait. really want to mm. make any comment that seems as if I'm, I'm, I'm second guessing any lawyer on any of the teams, mm. I would rather wait for the processes to come because what helps the process is after the, at the end of the day, when the ruling comes from the court, we are all entitled to comment on the ruling and criticize it if we don't agree. So I would wait for, for, for the, the, the proceedings to take the right. court to make its rulings, then mm. I will have my comments on the ruling. Okay, so yeah. Do Dominic, yeah. now, now, now here. Yeah. Um, so you say you are being stampeded. Yes. But you know that on the day when they made this decision, that day was actually the 21st day mm -hmm. after the petition was served. Yes. Which means that according to the timelines, that day was the day that the trial should have been ending. You see, are you not, there is, are you there not is, prolonging there matters? Is a, there is a certain misperception or let's say misconception about CR 99 that we need to, you know, um, you know, I mean, dispel. Mm. And that is that, you see, this whole idea that the trial has to end in 42 days has been sold to the, 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 the public as if to say that on a day by day basis, you have to be counting. But if you look at the CI itself, the second schedule actually says that you begin in January and you end in March. That's right. If it were the case that you were supposed to just count on a day by day basis, all right? Then it, it would have meant that we can actually do this, you know, before March. And the lawmaker was not stupid, you know, or acting irrationally when they put March here. It, it means that actual courtroom activity must not last more than 
42 days. All right? But by all means, I mean, by the end of March, we should terminate proceedings. Mm. So if you give us five days for case management, and then on the second day, because we had brought the application for interrogatories, so they said we had eaten into the, the first day of case management. So on the second day, we expected the usual practices and conventions relating to case management conferences to take place, where the, both parties and their lawyers and or their lawyers would be consulted by the court. How many documents are you going to be filing? What is the nature of the documents? Are they electronic and so on? How many witnesses are you going to call? How many days are you going to take for purposes of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, cross-examination and so on and so forth? In this case, okay. the days to take is known. There no, are six days no, for the trial. No, yeah, that, yes, but, that, but there are six days. But between the Electoral Commission and us, all right, are we taking one day and mm. they are taking two days <coughs> or three mm. days and so on? Within, so that is what it is, why it is called case management conference. Okay. So does it, does, it, does it make any difference that when you interact with a judge mm -hmm. in case management, it's not what you, everything you say that is sticking. Oh, no. So Certainly. it is possible, yes. and we face it in court. Yes. You have a discussion with the judge over the thing, but in the end, it's how the judge feels is the that, best. That is so. That may but, but be upheld. See, because adjudication is a deliberative. So does it make a difference? It, 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 does, it does make a difference in the sense that, okay, yes, when I'm consulted and the judge, based upon my responses, says that, look, I disagree with you. I don't think you should take two days to do mm. cross-examination. Mm. I think you, sh you, you one day can do your cross-examination. That alone is an inherent, you know, part of the, the process of case management and adjudication. All right? For you to not consult me and come out, even in the high court, you have done applications for directions before. Many, when, many. Has, when has a judge just come out, read your issues to you, and, and told you to file your 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 witness statement tomorrow. Mm. Has that ever happened? In but, but even in the Supreme Court, we know that both parties could agree outside before the court. You agree on the issues. It is when you can't agree that the court will intervene. That is so. Right. So, and, um, and Gary is... Just as it's happened in 2013, uh, 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 Gary, no. just as it's happened in 2013, something. the issues that were brought were many. The parties couldn't agree. Now the judges came in and they narrowed the issues down to two whether there were irregularities and so on and so forth, and if there were, whether they impacted the elections. How much of a change in the law or procedure has happened by what they have done, if any? Something. I disagree with you when you suggest that, or you put a question, that there was an imposition or there was no contribution on the side of the, the petitioner into the memorandum of issues that were far before the court. I, I, believe I, said that, I said that, not something. I believe my understanding was that uh, the petitioner had filed their uh, issues yes. in the morning. Is that not correct? That's exactly what I said, that they yeah, took so, their issues. Yes, so they've taken the loan without the uh, lawyer's involvement. That's what happened. Yes, something, but you filed your issues. You see, what was left for the court to do? The interrogatories had already been dismissed the day before. Was there any application before the court on the morning that the court didn't deal with on the no, morning? No. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it has been dismissed. No, there were other uh, preliminary matters, such as our request for, to inspect documents and so on. And then, the, I mean, uh, the request, you know, to, to admit uh, facts. facts. But those, re those requests, were they before the court on the morning? No, they, they had been filed. So that would have been part of the case management. Yeah, but, um, but they, that would have been look, part of look, the case look, management. Were they before the court at the time when they were taking down the issues? They are before the court. Well, my understanding if was. If they were not, they how were could not they have before. given a roadmap saying, my understanding was saying that, we are going to deal with this, yeah. this day, that day? That, my understanding was that there was nothing before the court. And if you no, look at. The court was, didn't say no, that. So let's look at the proceedings. No, 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 please. Let us not argue. Don't mislead the court. When we watch the television, Okay, I want to just say saying that, as it stands now, there is nothing before us. What, is, what was before us, what we dismissed yesterday, and it was addressing, uh, you know. And Tajushikata pointed out to them that we have these proceedings. That was before, before they came out with the roadmap. Yeah. You see, Correct? Something. Yeah. I would defer to what we all saw about the proceedings. What was before the court, if indeed it was far before the court on the, on the docket, I wouldn't see. I wouldn't see. But, but you are aware as part of the legal... I wouldn't see. I wouldn't see. I'm no, but the, the inherent question I'm asking you is, if you say they are unaware, but at the time they brought out the roadmap, 
if you are unaware, you don't say, I, I will deal with you, this your application the next day or the other day. You see, must be aware before you say, you see, I'll deal with it the next day. Something. Be that is me. Yeah, but the substantive question was, yes. is this standard? Because that's the impression being given, that it doesn't happen. That the judges will take your memorandum of issues without your input and then impose without, without, uh, without, the direction. Without which input? The directions are these. You have found the direction already. And the court has set your issues down for trial. Mm -hmm. So what input again are you talking about here? That's the question I'm asking. So there's well, nothing wrong there's with nothing, that. There's nothing wrong with it. You yeah. found your issues for directions. And, then, and the issues... No, are, no. Allow dog, 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 wait a minute. Oh. The issues have been filed by both sides. Mm. The petitioner has filed the issues. The respondent has filed the issues. They put it together as, as a run of issues. And they come and read it to you. And they give you a roadmap. Yeah. Now, you say, subsequent to that, you say, look, we have filed an application for review. At that time, at that time, the application for state had not been filed. And they said, well, it doesn't buy us. It doesn't tie our hands from proceeding with the matter. Mm -hmm. Now, you say you are going to file an application for stay of proceedings. Yes. No problem. So let the court go and deal with it. We are not judges here. Go and deal with the application for stay, and then decide one way or the other. And then you can all know the direction that the case will span. But you see something, the point I want to make, there is a certain semblance out there that, oh, we have a case in court. That case is an iron cast case. But you are trying to, or uh, more or less- Railroad, uh, you know, stampede. You know, stampede the, our, 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 our attempt to vindicate our grievances before the court. That impression is wrong. Mm. You know why it is wrong? The trial has not commenced. The trial has not commenced. Now, issues have not been filed, set down. File a witness statement, which is not different from what is contained in your petition. No. It, you know, it, it, I mean, lawyers do that, but mm. they are different. Do, do, you, now, do you realize that? I, 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 do you, do you realize that? Do you realize that, for example, the respondents, they have preliminary legal objection. Yes. Their desire would have been that the preliminary legal objection would be determined first. Yes. Exactly. So that... If it ends up terminating your case, they won't waste their time in the trial. Yes. They have been asked to file their processes and that the preliminary legal objection will be determined mm -hmm. and incorporated in the judgment. Yes. They clearly are not happy, but they have complied. Oh, Why can't you that, do the same? Well, that is, that is a different kettle of fish altogether, <laughs> mm. you know, substantively. Um, and that is because, you see, the Supreme Court itself has ruled on a number of occasions that when it comes to constitutional matters, mm. Okay, they are hesitant to dispose of matters, okay, I mean, through the raising of preliminary objections. And they have always said that you should incorporate it into your case, you know, I mean, your statement of case, all right, to be, to form part of your, your judgment. I mean, your, your, this in a... You, you agree that precedent yeah, is there? That precedent is there. You agree? Gary, you agree? You are not, you are you not see, certain. You I have had, I'm, 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 I'm not that. certain, but you see, you see, you see, you see, like rightly pointed out, we will have wished that that matter yes. is determined first yes. before we can go into the matter. But the, but the justices in their wisdom have decided yeah. that they will incorporate it as part of the final judgment. Yes. So well, it's okay. We're going we're gonna to abide by our, it. And actually, but our we have actually filed our witness statements. Our, okay. our fundamental agreement, mm. yeah, I, I saw your witness mm. statements. I've actually read, read them. Um, and my fundamental disagreement with mm. you, Gary, you know, you know, respectfully, is the fact that you have reduced case management or pre-trial to just a determination of the issues, you know, that have been okay. filed by the... All right. Uh, thank that's you very much, gentlemen. Nice. Unfortunately, uh, time is run out on us. Um, my guests have been Dr. Dominic Ayene, who is MP Borga Central, uh, Borga okay. East. Uh, that's my constituency. I can't get it wrong. Borga East and member of the legal team of the John Mahama team. <laughs> uh, Clara is on Zoom with us. Uh, Clara Berry Cassetti is lawyer and lecturer, University of Ghana Law School. Dr. Okoboy joined us earlier, former Deputy Minister of Health and member New Patriotic Party Communications team. Uh, Kwame Sapong, a CEDU, pharmacist and fellow Ghana Center for Democratic Development also joined us. And Gary Nemako Mafo, member legal and constitutional committee of the New Patriotic Party. He's got a lot of work um, this uh, period, right? Yes, yes. A lot of uh, illegal suit battles. Yeah. I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. Thank you all so very much for your company. See you again next week, God willing, with another edition. Wear your mask and sanitize.